Yeah, I'm Arch Robinson. Uh, I work for Intel, at least up until this Friday. The, uh, and this is a repeat, largely a repeat of my tutorial la last uh, year, so much of the material should look familiar. I've changed a few things to bring it up to date for Julia 0.4. Uh, then I'm retired. So, yeah, I'll, I'll go to sleep as an Intel employee in the hotel and I'll wake up as a retiree. I already checked with HR whether I can build a hotel. And they say, yep, that's fine. <laughs> All right, the goal is to learn how to write uh, Julia code um, that is generic, performant, and concise. Uh, by generic, I mean it still uses the power of Julia to write code that works on many different types. If we're just going to write Julia code that works for just one type, well, we might as well be writing garbage collected C. And we want it to be performant, otherwise, well, we might as well be writing Python or something. And concise. You don't want to be kind of losing the point if you're writing as much code as you had to do to write C. So, yeah, some disclaimers. Uh, I'm focused on numerics. I have not covered the string issues in this workshop, and I don't mention the thing about, well, string interpolation it isn't cheap. It's convenient, but it's not cheap. Uh, Julian's compiler are getting better. In fact, I noticed in revised my notes, I ran almost all the examples back through the current compiler, and things are much better on some points, particularly the garbage collector is much faster in Julia 0.4 than 0.3, so some offenses, the penalty's lower now. The, uh, I'm also I'm covering only single-threaded execution. There's workshop this afternoon on uh, parallel Julia, so I figured there's no point in covering that. Uh, and finally, any times I show, they're for one machine on one day, in one configuration, and it may differ the next day. So I, I don't hold me to the, anything past the first decimal digit on the performance numbers. And finally, yeah, uh, what's known as the map maker's dilemma. If you have a map that is perfectly accurate, it is completely useless because a perfectly accurate map is the same as the reality it's trying to map. So it doesn't help you understand it. So in some cases, I may brush off things or just look at first order effects or oversimplify things slightly, but that's for sake of getting the key points across. So I'll cover briefly yeah, the, the Julia tool chain, uh, some stuff about hardware considerations. And then the, mo, mo, a lot of time we spend on the Julia type system. And I'll have a break with, so I can got used to restroom, get some food, and do homework. Pro I have a few homework problems. And then I'll go into uh, optimizations and distinguishing which ones you need to do by hand still and which ones the compiler will do a better job and, not waste your, and you shouldn't be wasting your time on. And another break, and I have uh, two more homework problems. And then, if I haven't run out of time, I'll go into vectorization. Where it means, sorry, this, vectorization means two things in the Julia community. Uh, unfortunately, it means two things. One is writing Fortran 90 style code where you're operating uh, on arrays at a time. And the other is uh, the, the, the older usage from Fortran, which means the code is converted into a form that's amenable to the, the uh, Single instruction mobile data hardware. So the Julia uh, tool chain, you start out, you have some sort of problem you're trying to solve. You write some source code. And then you run it through the Julia compiler. And then that turns it into machine code. And then the machine code is actually not down to the metal yet. The machine code, at least on the modern high-end processors, goes through some more translation on the chip where it's finally flipping the transistors. And the rate at which you flip the transistors and getting your work done by flipping the fewest is uh, how you speed up the code. So that funny cloud at the bottom, yeah, you, you can't see it directly. But what you can do is to get some idea of what, what, what's going on is you can run, uh, run the Julia profiler. And that gives a complete the feedback loop back to you, the programmer, so you can mess with your source code and perhaps flip the transistors more efficiently. So there's also one more little sub loop in there. The Julia compiler 
has ways of telling you sort of what's going on, and I'll, I'll go into detail on that. So sometimes you can just iterate on the little short loop, not have to go all the way down to timing your code. So there's two profilers available. One is the, the profile module that's built in, into Julia, and it's pretty straightforward to use. There's this, you have a function foo you want to time, you say, uh, or you type in at profile foo, and it runs the profiler, and then you write profile.print, and it'll dump a, a profile, and it gets you more or less line by line with a count of how many times each line was hit. And then for fans of uh, the VTune uh, amplifier from Intel on in Intel platforms, you can also use that for Profile Julia. And it has a graphical interface, and it's for people like to dive down and see the, uh, look at the source code and the assembly code at the same time. It does require uh, building Julia from source and uh, tweaking the make file slightly. So just a few things, yeah, people first get started on uh, timing and profiling code, they tend to make some mistakes and uh, get misled as to what's going on or send complaints to Stack Overflow. Hey, I don't understand what's going on. The uh, common mistake is not warming up the system first. Particularly for Julia, the first time code is executed, it's compiled. And so if you just execute your code once under a profiler, you're not just profiling your code, you're profiling the compiler. Uh, the other thing, and uh, this applies to languages like Fortran and C that are compiled ahead of time, is that uh, the first time your code runs, it's pulling data out of main memory and into the caches. And so you're starting out with so-called, what people call a cold cache. And so if you just run your code once, you're really timing the time it takes to load, the, load data into the caches. Uh, another problem on modern processors, and this is a, 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 it's a doozy. Uh, on a typical modern processor, unlike your laptops, the clock varies by a factor of at least two, maybe three, from the lowest and the highest. And the machine is just automatically throttling up and down depending upon the load. If you want to get accurate benchmarks, you have to turn that throttling off. Uh, on Windows, I know it's under like the power options, under advanced, you mess with uh, it's, what they call it, processor state or something. I don't know how to turn it off and on on Linux. But something to pay attention to, because you be, your measurements will be off by a factor of two or three if you haven't uh, got that, that processor cranked to a, a constant rate. Now sometimes, if you know you have a heavy workload, you can just like get it going and then start timing, and the processor will more or less be at maximum throttle anyway. OK, timing too short a run. If you try to time. Uh, uh, Various profiling systems are accurate only to, uh, to a, so many nanoseconds or microseconds or milliseconds, and if your run is shorter than that, your results will be junk. On the other hand, at least my opinion is, yeah, some people run their codes for hours to profile them. It's like, to me, if it takes more than a few seconds to profile it, you're doing something wrong. Okay, and timing, oh, timing is something that the optimizer remove, removes. Optimizers get, their job is to optimize code and remove stuff that is not doing anything useful. If you just time a pure function and you don't print the result from it, the f optimizer has rights to completely eliminate that function. Now, the Julia optimizer is not there yet, but it will be one day, and you're not sure when that day is going to arrive. So I would be really careful. My, my normal practice is to, my time of function is I print out like the result or a hash code of the result, something that it couldn't possibly have figured out without, at, without actually executing the function. Don't rely upon just so-called on obfuscations. People sometimes think, oh yeah, I'll just write this really complicated thing. The optimizer won't understand how to remove that. You'd be surprised what the optimizers can figure out sometimes. Um, Julia's not necessarily there yet, but other compilers are there. I remember our early, in the 1990s working on a C++ compiler, we used to remove people's RCS strings because they weren't being used anywhere. People used to real complicate the address, so pass it to this fake function of this. We'd strip it all out because none of it was being used. So yeah, be careful. Uh, Okay, the other thing is, oh, one other point here. Ignoring the, uh, now, I said you have to get the system warmed up to time it accurately. There's one exception to that. 
if what you're really trying to measure is from a cold start, because say that's what the user does when they start up Julia, then the warm-up time really should be included as part of your, your benchmarking. So here's the, the lazy person's way to warm up the system. The, uh, you simply get, write your code and then run the time command twice. The first time will force the compilation and the second time will time it after it's compiled. So here's an example. Um, the first run took about uh, 2.7 milliseconds and the second run ran way faster because the system had compiled the code. So yeah, my normal technique is just, I'll just write, I'll just do time, time, maybe three times in a row and look at the spread of the last two runs to see if they're close. And also here, you notice here, I, I, print, I, I uh, compute a result and then when I'm done, I print a hash code of it and that forces the system to execute it. So another important profiler, in, uh, oh, let's see, I should point it out here that the, uh, the time command gives you two numbers. It gives you the amount of time the code took. It also tells you how much memory was allocated. And here, it, you notice when the compiler ran the first time, it was, uh, uh, there was thousands of allocations. The second time around, there was only four allocations. And after we get through the rest of this workshop, you should see, the, you'll see the sort of things that generate memory allocations and the sort of things that don't. And so if this report is way off from your expectations, it's worth looking into. And one way to tra track down the offender is with the heap allocation profiling. What you do is you, uh, write, you write your code and say maybe this has a problem here. And so then, if you run Julia with this uh, dash dash uh, track allocation equal user option, it's in the documentation, then when you run your program, it will create uh, some profile files for each of the, the pieces of source code. And uh, the name, name of the file will be the uh, same as the source file, but with a dot mem suffix. And it'll tell you what, where the, uh, the allocations are happening. Now, oh, yeah, one, one point here. There is an issue that the, uh, the allocation profiler misplaces the, uh, the, uh, the blame uh, slightly. It, it misplaces the blame if you call it from a, a very top level uh, interactive call. So, or, sorry, not just interactive call, just top level call at all. So what you need to do is wrap the, uh, the call to the function you're really interested in. Well, here, I'm really trying to uh, profile tally, but I need to wrap, call it from a wrapper, otherwise there'll be a, a misattribution of where the allocations are coming from. And then I, I don't want to look at the number of allocations the compiler is doing, so I force compilation of it first by r running it once. And notice also I, I print the result, so the, uh, I also want to compile print line. And then given that, now I run it for real. I clear, the I clear all the allocation counters. So now it resets all the allocation counters. I run the code again, and then it'll uh, record the, the memory allocation for actually running this tally function. And then I look at the, uh, the .mem file, and it'll show me the uh, various, each line of the file, the source, and the number of memory allocations. And they're looking at, I'll see there's 32,000 allocations for just doing this plus equals, which is a sign that there's an issue. And I'll go in later what, what, what the issue is. So just a bit about mem uh, hardware resources. We're not programming abstract Turing machines. This is real hardware. There's... Yeah, there's memory and there's compute. The uh, memory on modern machines is, has, a, is a, has a hierarchy where you have a little bit of very fast memory and lots of slow memory. 
So here's roughly a picture drawn sort of the scale, only the picture of the memory, the block of memory, for main memory should be like as big as the blackboard or maybe extends out of the room, I, I forget. The, uh, and then you'll have an outer level cache on the machine, a typical laptop, maybe it's about four uh, megabytes. And that's really your, your useful memory for programming in as far as speed. And then inside that there'll be other levels of cache and maybe the, the innermost cache maybe will only be about 32 kilobytes. And then there's, yeah, at the very fast, the fastest memory is the registers of the machine. Those can be access, and roughly, uh, in this picture, the length of the lines is supposed to indicate the, the, the time it takes to access that memory. So the registers may be one clock, the L1 cache, about three clocks. Uh, outer level cache, I forget, 10 or 30 clocks or something. The main memory, at least 100. Now, some, oh, the other key point is, as far as the communication in main memory and all the way up to the registers, it's not done on the byte level. The, machine, the smallest piece of data the machine can grab is, called, is a so-called cache line. And the cache lines run on the order of, uh, well, there's 64 bytes on the Intel systems. They're probably between 32 and 128 on other systems. That means if you basically, you touch one byte in memory, it pulls in the entire cache line. So touching the bytes in the same cache line comes as a freebie. On the other hand, if you pick up a byte here, a byte there, a byte way over there, you're picking up whole cache lines from each place. So you're eating up, say, uh, if the cache lines are 64 bytes, you thought you were only picking up, say, a million bytes, you're actually picking up 64 million bytes because each byte was carrying in the whole cache line with it. Okay, some machines have hardware prefetch, which means it's uh, basically looks at how your code is reading from memory and says, oh, there's a uh, arithmetic sequence to the addresses here. They're counting by, say, threes. And it will say, ah, I know, I think they're going to keep going like that and pick up the next multiple of, of three. So on the compute side, we have uh, just a uh, typical machine has a bunch of sockets. Well, a laptop is just going to be one socket. And each socket has a chip in it, and each chip has some uh, Functional units, typically about, oh, I think about eight these days. And each, and different, different functional units do different things, like maybe add, uh, integer adds, integer multiplies, uh, floating point multiplies, floating point adds, shifts. The, uh, and they can all run concurrently. And then each functional unit has typically a, a single instruction multiple data unit on it. And those, functional, those units can uh, operate on multiple pieces of data at the same time. Like if I set it up right, I can take eight numbers plus eight other numbers and, and take the uh, element-wise sums and do that in a, a single clock cycle. But only if I set things up just right. So the ideal use of the har uh, hardware at least for, for the uh, CPUs is you want the, the SIMD units going full speed. You want most of your memory accesses pretty much have to hit the uh, L1 cache. If you keep hitting memory, memory, on, main memory on every access, you're looking at probably a factor of 100 slowdown. So yeah, you, you want, the, it's called, and the hardware architect calls this a stall. When you go out and fetch memory, something from memory and it misses the cache and you have to go out the main memory, it's, it's called a stall. And basically the processor stops to wait for that uh, fetch to come in. Except for now there's sort of, the, the machines have so-called out of order pipelines where it'll try to keep doing the rest of the computation as far as it can go without having to know what the, va knowing what the value of the, uh, the stalled memory fetch is. And finally, yeah, the hardware, a lot of the cores have uh, multi-threading. For example, on the, uh, a lot of the Intel processors, they have two hardware threads on the same core. So if one hardware thread's completely stuck, the other one can keep going. And on our Knight's Landing processors, there's four hardware threads that keep the processor busy. All right, one other point about, yeah, real hardware is, yeah, the default in Julia is float 64 for floating point. But float 32 is going to be faster. 
it's not actually so much that the, uh, the internal circuitry on the actual multiply add functional unit is going to be faster. It's really usually because it, a float 32 takes half the bandwidth to pull into the processor from memory. Or at least if, when you pull in a cache line that's 64 bytes, you can either, that cache line could have 16 float, float 32s in it or only 8 float 64s. So you can pull in float 32s about twice as fast as float 64s. They occupy half as much uh, cache memory. And the SIMD units, well, just because of the width, the, you can cram twice as many into a, a SIMD vector, they can process twice as many at the same time. So if you're really going after speed and floating point, you, you want to look at whether float 32 will get the job done. Now, sometimes it won't get the job done because you need the extra precision, but a lot of times it can. I mean, if, if you have data coming from, particularly from the real world, the data is only good to probably 16 bits anyway in a lot of cases. All right. Right, semantics versus implementation. Yeah, I want to be clear on this because some people get this confused. Semantics is what the program, the, the language standard or specification, Julie really doesn't have a standard, there's just one implementation of it, but there's documentation that says what it's supposed to do. And that's the level at which it says how, how the program's supposed to behave, at least as far as what you can observe. And observe is normally from the what you can see as far as input and output or from the interactive session. It doesn't count what you can see, say if you attach a digital trace analyzer to the circuitry and peeked inside. But the semantic, semantic level is where you argue about whether the program's correct or not. You don't say, oh yeah, on an x86 processor, the uh, memory behavior is like this. No, at the semantic level, it's like you, re you argue from the Julia documents. But then when you get down to the implementation level, that's where you argue about the, and reason about the uh, performance. That's where you actually you do care. Oh yeah, I'm targeting an x86. Maybe I do care about the way the memory fence behaves. So as far as proving correct, yeah, the key point is when, when uh, arguing about correctness, you don't assume a particular implementation. You go upon what the documents say. C, semantics for variables. Yeah, a lot of people come, and, and uh, this is a Julia workshop. Why am I talking about C? The reason is a lot of people come from a C background or Fortran background or anybody program in Algol? No, it's, <laughs> the, uh, those languages have very different semantics for variables. The, uh, there, there, there's a piece of example code on the left. The, uh, I have an int variable x. And then I assign it to value 2. Then I assign it to value 3.1. And so the x starts out as undefined. I stuff the 2 in it. And then I stuff the 3.1 in it. Well, the 3.1 really won't fit. So it has to be, oops, that's a typo on that slide. Sorry, there's no, you can't stuff a 3.1 in there, obviously. That's supposed to say 3 there. In fact, yeah, the whole, the whole point of the slide is supposed to be that, yeah, you stuff a 3.1 in a box that's at type int, it's going to truncate it down to a 3. All right, then the, 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 the variable goes away. So the, the variables in C and Fortran, they're actually, they're, they're talking about, the variable is a location in memory. That's very different than Julia, where a variable is just a name that's bound to a value, and it can be bound to different values. The, the name itself is, it, it's not a location in memory. There, there's no concept of taking the address of a variable in, in Julia. It makes no sense. So here's a uh, yeah, function foo in Julia on the right. And when I sign x equals 2, it's just x is, you can think of it as, it points to a 2. Now internally, maybe that it's not, there's no pointer there. Maybe the compiler probably optimizes the way so it stuffs a two actually somewhere in a stack frame or in a register. 
But conceptually, the two is just out in some space and the x is going to point to it. And then when I assign 3.1 to it, the x is just, I'm repointing it somewhere else. But the x itself is just this abstract tag. The 2 and the 3.1 are the things that are somewhere in memory. OK, now real machines, they can't be quite that abstract. Real machines have, have to deal with this. So the way it, it's normally done is through something called boxing. And Julia Compiler uses uh, boxing for objects that don't have a known type, a known compile time type. If they have a known compile time type, the, the compiler can do better. We'll, we'll go through that. But if they, if they don't, the compiler will box them. So for example, here, the uh, function bar here, I assigned, the compiler said, oh, they assigned a 2 to x, they assigned a 3.1 to x. Well, sometimes x is 2, sometimes a 3, sometimes it's an int, sometimes it's a float. So what the compiler will do is it'll use a box for that. Whereas the compiler will say, why, oh, y is always a floating point uh, value. I don't need a box for that because I know what the type is. So the compiler builds the data structure on the right there where we have y is a the value, say, on the stack or in the register that just has the, the raw data in it, it's called an unboxed value. And then x is a boxed value, and a boxed value is just something typically heap allocated and it has a pointer to it. And the little thing, the thing allocated on the heap has not only the data, but also has a type tag on it, saying what the type of the data is. I really want to upgrade that slide. We've changed the, the garbage collector changed a while back. So actually the, the point, if you don't get down to the details, the pointer is actually to the data and the type sitting at a negative offset. Is there a performance reason for that? For the offset thing? Yeah. Move the pointer to the data. Um, I'm trying to think if it affects any real cases. There, there may be some cases with alignment issues. Yeah, I've forgotten all the considerations that went into that. Okay, now some, there's some the boxing incurs some penalties. The, uh, first of all, there's an extra level of indirection. So there's going to be an extra level of fetch when the processor fetches the data because it's going to fetch the pointer first and it's going to follow the pointer. If you talk to our hardware architects, they really hate indirect loads because they, they can't predict them. Uh, the other penalty is that there's also a, uh, there's a heap allocation of the data. And that's what the, the, heap, the Julia, uh, the, the uh, allocation profiler will show you, is sh show these heap allocations. And that's the tip off that this boxing is going on. And finally, there's another, another penalty that when I add X and Y, because the, uh, the X is in a box, the compiler doesn't know the type of X, so when it goes to execute the, do the addition, it's not sure what kind of addition it's doing. It might be doing integer plus integer or float plus integer, or say float plus float. So it has to go through a, a lookup table of various ways to add things and pick out the right one. Yes, you do. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, and this is into the subject of how, well, how flow sensitive do you want your analyzer to be? Uh, the Julia, the current type inference is something that's called flow insensitive. It pays no attention to the control flow. It just treats all those assignments to X as unordered. Maybe they're under ifs or whatnot. and analyzes it that way. If Julia had a flow sensitive analyzer, such as uh, you find like LLVM with uh, this something called static single assignment, which is a, a popular uh, flow sensitive way to analyze these things, then yes, x, you detect x as float. In fact, you'd probably you'd kill off the x equals 2 because it's a, so called a dead assignment. But the current state of the Julia type inference is that it's, it's flow insensitive. So. And I don't know why. Anybody know why, why it doesn't use static single assignment? I've... Question for Jeff whenever he. <laughs> 
You can tell him Art sent you. To, <laughs> Art said, well, why aren't you using static single assignment? <laughs> All right. So yeah, just to recap, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the Julia source is a, in Julia source, the names are bound to the values and type declarations are optional. And then the Julia compiler takes that source and turns it into machine code where values are stored in locations. And if the compiler can't determine uh, precisely what the type of the value is, then they're going to have to store it and put it in a box. And so semantically, yeah, everything just in the, in the top box is how you argue about correctness of a program. You don't have to know anything about the boxing. And, and Julia implementations, no matter how good the optimizer is, they have to behave the same as a naive Julia implementation that just worked off the Julia source. At least that's the theory, I think. <laughs> this one's arguments over that for like, a, I think it's the array, the implicit array constructor, you write just br open bracket, blah, 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 close bracket. Um, there's been discussions as to how much the type inference is allowed to deduce the type of the result before it's actually executed the code. So, neat, neat feature about Julia is that uh, you can, it has this introspection feature where you can look at the code at various points in the compilation process without owning the uh, developer copy of the compiler. If you work on a C++ or C compiler, the only thing you can dump for the most part is the final assembly code. You can't look at the intermediate stages. That's something for the compiler developers. But Julia is cool because anybody can look at, look at the intermediate stages. So roughly, yeah, the stages of the compiler are, you start out and you parse the source into the syntax tree, you, then the macros are expanded, then the syntax tree is uh, lowered in some ways to uh, simplify it, then the type inference runs, then we build the LLVM code, ship it off to the LLVM, which optimizes it, and the LLVM produces the, emits the final machine code. And the levels you can peek at all right, you can look at after the syntax tree is lowered with this, there's a function called code lowered. You can just, you, and I'll show examples of calling these things. Uh, code warn type will show you the results after type inference. And there's an older function called code typed, but I'll show you just code warn type because it has some nice uh, highlighting. It points out the spots that may be causing sl slowdowns. And you can look at the, if you're an LLVM fan, you can look at the LLVM code being spit out. Now, if you're a hardcore uh, x86 or ARM person that likes to read assembly code that's not marked up too, wet, <laughs> too clearly, uh, you can look at the machine code. I like the code LLVM level myself. Question on that. Um, yeah. I know there's an ex a macro expand that would expand a macro for you, but I don't know if it does it like multiple macro expansions within a function. Oh. Not from the Julia, let's see, the Julia, there's a dash O switch, and I think the, no, the default, we don't really have a dash O zero that turns everything off from what I recall. The, uh, is what, oh, debug? Oh, yes. There's a debug build, yeah, debug build, and you pass in the right option yeah. uh, back to an environment variable, what is it, Julia LLVM args. Pass but then, you, yeah, you get a dump between every pass of the LLVM output. Um, you do want to redirect that to a file. I've, I, I've used it on occasion. And, and then you can look at every stage, and uh, every intermediate part. And the, the step between building and optimizing the LLVM that's, that's within, inside Julia, so you, you don't normally see it. And uh, unless you're trying to like, debug LLVM or something, it's not something you want to look at. Uh, I mean, the final LLVM is worth looking at sometimes, but the intermediate parts are, aren't. I said, co yeah, co my, my, my personal experience, I usually use code warn type and code LLVM. And I'll show some examples of code LLVM, and it's, usually I'm not looking at it in real detailed manner, I'm just looking for a few uh, red flags. 
So yeah, he, here's an example of the code lowered output. The, uh, yeah, the function's at the top, and you see that's a very small function, and it, it cranks out a, a, a lot of stuff. Now, oh, one, one point is, Julia functions are always are, are polymorphic. The arguments uh, could be of any type, typically, unless there's unless the types are uh, have de declared. And so when you call code lowered, you have to give it two arguments. You give it the function that you want the code for, and you give it the argument types that you want the code for. So bar applied to an int is going to have very different code than, say, bar applied to a, a, f a float. Now there's also a, a alternative syntax. Uh, if, for each of these function, dumping functions, there's a macro version that you hand it a call, a, a, an example call. So, I, so to use at code lowered, I hand it bar of zero. And basically, it's just going to treat the zero as, well, they're talking about, they want to see the call bar for an int type. So depending upon circumstance, the, the uh, the macro form with the actual argument or the other form with the, just the, the types it will be more convenient. And I, I end up flip-flopping between the two, depending upon circumstance. All right. Okay, code warn type will dump the code. It's like code lowered, only it also it dumps the code and the types that have been deduced for the various pieces. Now, for example, here, I, I asked for uh, there's a cut and paste on this slide. This one's, yeah, that one I really want to fix. This is, Yeah, code warrant type of, of print the, prints the types that have been deduced for the uh, pieces. And I'll show some other examples where code warrant type uh, points out by either uh, capitalizing or using a different color the, the things that are of a deduced a type that'll make things run slow. So here's yeah, code LLVM. The, uh, this is for, for bar called on an int. It basically munches everything down to an add, add instruction. And you see the y, the y is completely, well, the y and the x are both essentially disappeared. And it's just that, well, the, R, it, the code in LLVM basically says, yeah, to take the incoming argument and subtract one and return it. Then if you go down to the machine code level, yeah, he, here's, Code native will tell you that. And you have to be an x86 fan to love this stuff. So yeah, just to, to summarize the chain, I think that the parts that, at least to me, are most useful are the, the, the code warn type, because that helps you understand what the type inference is doing. And as I'll show later, it, it highlights the types where things have gone astray. Or, and then at the LLVM level, it's useful sometimes for uh, detecting performance issues just by some, uh, I'll show you some, some red flags that in the code. Oops. So concrete versus non-concrete types. I, I think this is pretty much the core of the, uh, this and the type inference are the, uh, the core of the workshop. The, Julia distinguishes concrete and non-concrete types. Concrete types are things for which they have a definite known bit layout. So like an int. Uh, int on a 64-bit system, it'll be a 64-bit int. On a 32-bit system, it'll be a 32-bit int. At compile time, the compiler knows exactly what hardware type it corresponds to. Likewise, a vector of int, it'll be laid out exactly the same as a Fortran one-dimensional array of int. The uh, tuple, a tuple of an int in the float 32, the compiler knows exactly the bit layout. It says, ah, it's, it'll be a, say, a 64-bit system, 64-bit int followed by a 32-bit float. It knows exactly how the bits are laid out. And likewise, for a type here, foo with an x and a y, similar to the tuple. 
Now, non-concrete types are ones where the compiler doesn't know the bit layout, and therefore they require boxing. Uh, any, the very top of the type hierarchy, is definitely boxed because it could be anything in the system. Uh, integer includes, say, 8 bit integer, 16 bit, 32, 64, really big integers. So the compiler doesn't know the exact bit layout of that. The vector of t is a parametric type. So until t is, the, the value of t is, that is known, that's the, the vector t is instantiated, we don't know, uh, know the bit layout at all. And then union types in Julia, a union of an int32 and int64, well that's saying very directly, this type could be an int32 or an int64. So the compiler's not gonna know the layout of, for a union. When you know the T, then it becomes concrete. Okay. Well, then maybe it becomes concrete. If the T is any, you're still stuck. It's, well, then I'll get, it, get to it, yeah. Then it's sort of concrete and sort of not. Yeah, that's what I call it, yeah, the quicksand types. They're, they're, they're partway in between. So here I have a, a type circle, and it has X, Y, and R. And circle is very definitely a concrete type. The compiler knows how to lay out the, uh, the circle. It's going to be three fields. The catch is it doesn't know the type of the three fields. So the, without any further information, the three fields themselves are going to be abstract, uh, non-concrete types. And so they have to be boxed. So X, Y, and R have to point off to three pieces of tagged data. So I'm going to pay the, the boxing costs. Now you think, well, maybe I can tighten things up a bit. If I make uh, X, Y, and R real, I've now tightened the type bounds on it, but real is still not a concrete type. It because it includes integers of various sizes, floating point of various sizes, so the boxing is still required. The compiler has a little more information, but probably not enough to really do much good. Uh, maybe some, you know, if you call a function on circle dot, uh, the x field, and the compiler knows that there's only one version of the function that works on reals, maybe the dispatch speeds up a little bit. All right, to really make a concrete type out of circle, we have to get the fields down to the concrete types themselves. So here's type circle with float 64s for the fields. And now the compiler knows exactly how to lay out a circle I mean, completely. It knows that X, Y, and Z are 64-bit floats. Lay them out consecutively in memory. It's a nice, compact, uh, contiguous representation. Now the catch is now that we've solved the problem of making circle concrete and the compiler can uh, generate code for this fairly efficiently, Drawback is now we're losing some of the, the polymorphism. So the way to get that back is to make circle a, a parametric type. So I can add a, add a type parameter, declare the fields using the type parameter, and now I have a circle that I can use as float 64, float 32s, maybe some other float kinds, or integers even. So in practice, my, my usual reason I do this is because I'm not sure whether I want to use float 32s or float 64s. And I want to maybe try my code with float 32s and see if that will suffice and only go to 64 if I'm desperate. So now I can instantiate the type and now it's laid out. Now just to compare, now I can do one of two things. I can instantiate with float 64 and get my nice compact uh, concrete type or I can instantiate circle with an abstract type like real, and now I end up with boxes. But I, I get my choice and can make the decision later as to which way to go. So just to point out, yeah, give you some idea of the performance difference, because it is rather severe. Here's an example of circle, with the parametric circle, and I've I have a function that determines whether two circles touch, and I have a piece of code that goes through a 
takes a vector of circles and goes through all possible pairs and checks whether they touch. And now I run that code for two different kinds of circles, circles of, of real and circles of float 64. And you can see here for real, and I've timed it three times, so first time I'm timing the compiler, not the code really. You can see that there are uh, millions, of that, uh, almost four million allocations. Because it's having the box that box a lot of th each of the circles, and but boxes the circles. Well, then it has to do the dynamic dispatch uh, when it does the various calls. So there's a lot of slowness. Whereas now, if I do the circle of float 64, the compiler knows how it's laid out. Doesn't have to heap allocate it. The uh, vector of those circles is just one long contiguous vector of the where each each element, the three fields packed together. And the dispatch uh, for the function calls, the compiler knows exactly what types it's dealing with, so there's no lookup. So the code runs much faster, and you can see there's only one allocation. What is that? Is that probably with the vector itself or something? No, no. Uh, be honest, I'm not sure where the one allocation comes from. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's, oh, good, good, excellent question. Um, it's because that plus equals and the K, the, K the, the compiler can't even figure out the return type of touch. Oh, because, okay, because touch is returning a, a real, which is not. Yep. Okay. All right, it doesn't even know what, let's see, touch, touch, or let's see, da, 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 da. no, touch is returning, no, it's less than, the return type of touch is return type of less than or equals up there at the top, but that less than or equals itself, yeah. the compiler can't predict the return type of that because it's being fed arguments that, it, that in turn it doesn't know the return types of. This is the thing about, I'll get to a little more about this, when the compiler can't figure out the return type of a function, it poisons the entire call chain upwards. <coughs> Anything that result feeds into is now poisoned as the compiler can't figure out. Well, in a normal world, it does, and all the definitions available so far are, but the compiler doesn't know you're not going to slip another one in there later. Or it's up there, I think there's also something about, I think, I seem to remember if there's only a few definitions, the compiler will try to prove that they all return the same type, but there's like a limit, and once you're above that number, there's some threshold, and above that number, the compiler will give up, and less than or equal is probably one of those that has a zillion definitions and goes over the limit. I would say the limit's not like an order of, yeah, I want to say it's like a handful or four or something. It's, yeah? Have you tried with Jeff's new return type declaration? Let's see. Cursor. Yeah, we could, we could actually improve things there. Yeah, right. If touch, after touch, I wrote uh, colon, colon, bool, I could force the, tell the compiler, yes, um, less than or equals is whatever it returns, please convert it to a bool and then add it in the K. And then I could, yeah, that would solve the, the allocation problem there. Let's see. Okay, and I should note here, I've been a bad person in this, but yes. Oh, yeah, actually, the, the gotcha is that in the real case, yeah, th this would require, f this gets back to, uh, well, it require actually some fair, f tricky analysis because it also, yes, at the, it, it could deduce it at the circle of T part in principle, but then. My question is, if, like, let's say that you just had circle and you got rid of the type um, parameter in the circle call, and then you just passed it brand like that, then wouldn't it, Oh, um, I think I tried this example, let's see, this sort of was a similar example. Now, if I left out the type parameter, you know, let's see, is this, yeah, I'm not sure. You mean the, the type, uh, which, the, 
You mean the line of si the sign with the A, right? The uh, yeah. So so if type circle was just x y r, and then you just say a equals circle, and you pass three rings to it, but, and you didn't. Yeah. Oh oh yeah yeah that, that, oh oh the inner the inner the the, the constructor on the inner part yeah. yeah yes yes then it would deduce the type there, and I'd have a circle of floats. But then the outer one, the outer array, I think I still get burned. Um, oh, well, I mean, in, in that case, there would no be four T in, because T wouldn't yeah. exist. But like, if, if you just made a type circle, and you just define it with three floats. Yeah, then I'm good. Then it won't, yeah. So it only yeah. gets screwed up here, because you actually give it the option to. Yeah, I give it the option. and, and I was going to say, yeah, and part of it is even, the, even if the compiler could deduce for the, uh, up to the point of the assignment of A, that doesn't, it'd have to figure out that I never then destructively update an element in place with the, the, the circle of uh, real. Well, the touch, so, so the touch function that does the squared operations, would it deduce the, I mean, could it infer that the output of touch would still be a flow of 64? No. The output of the result of touch is a oh, bool. Is a bool. Yeah. 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 So, but would it be able to infer that if it knew that the inputs the X, Y, and R were all floats? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. If if it knows they're all floats. Did, did I hear you to say that with the parametric circle, if I instantiate my circle type using uh, float sixty four and do stuff with that? Just the very fact that the type definition is parametric means that whatever I do with my float 64 instance, the compiler is always going to be thinking, oh, maybe he can switch in a. a, a oh, no, no, no. If it's, if it's like C templates. If you said it was a float 64, it knows it's always a float 64. If it was instantiated with float 64, the compiler knows it's a float 64. And that's it never goes back to thinking, the real. Yeah, f f f uh, circle of float 64 and float circle of real are two separate types with no parent-child uh, relationship. There's no covariance. It, it gets back to there's no covariance. I think that happens if you just say circle. Then, it, then you can put whatever you want in there, and it can't tell. Oh, if, if you have a parametric type that you don't give it to the parameter? Yeah. Or all of the parameters, you can get some of them. Yeah, there's some funny rules on that because I remember if you like construct an if I leave out the parameter, I just construct it. It'll deduce the parameter. Um, like the earlier question about that, that inner the constructor the inner one with the three rands. If I left out the t, yes, it would just construct a circle of float float 64. Let's see, I say one thing uh, about good doing good benchmarking. I, I cheated and I, I didn't bother to print the result of count touch. So in principle, the compiler could have just eliminated the whole thing if it could figure out there's no side effects. And one day, I hope it can. I know the in Intel compiler for C++ would definitely wipe the whole thing out. <laughs> It, it shows up, um, actually, it's usually intermediate stages in the compiler, because a lot of times the compiler transforms will take a piece of code and generate a different form and a different form. It's easier to write the form, and you write the new code, and then you just assume some other pass where you move the debris that was no longer used. It's sort of like garbage, you can think of it like garbage collection of the code. That, that's where it usually shows up. Yeah, in practice, most people write the stuff that's going to be used, but not always. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Compile time. Yeah. Comparisons. Uh, no. A lot of times, I know from C++ experience, a lot of it's like uh, no op destructors that do nothing. You want to just tear those out. Okay. Let's see. What okay. Uh, what are we doing here? Okay. Types versus immutable. Um, something I didn't cover last year. 
there's two ways to declare a, a, a record-like structure in Julia. There's type and there's immutable. Now, here, the type, when you declare a type, it's basically passed around by reference all the time. So here I have a parametric, I hope I got this right. I, I, I scribbled this slide this morning outside. The, uh, I have a pair there called uh, immutable2, or I I m2, and it has two fields. And then the two fields, or it's not the way, it's not implicitly the fields, it's the, if m2, more or less you think of it, by default, it's gonna be always passed by reference. So when I have m2 of m2, the, uh, the, the, on the outer, outer one, the, uh, the a and the b are gonna point because they have, they have to be pointers or because we're past the, uh, the types passed by reference. And then inside that, the fields on the, the inner two M2s, those don't have pointers because ints are so-called a mutable type. They can't be changed. Ints are just, they're, they're values. You can't change an int. Uh, three is three. Um, In a what? The yeah, bit, bits types are the, the, the immutable. Now, if I the other way to declare the structure is as uh, immutable, and that's telling the compiler that the, uh, the once I construct the object, the fields are not going to change. And because it's not going to change, the, the compiler knows that even if it's passed by normally by by reference, well, two re it can never one of the reference can't be used to change the value of it ever. So the compiler is free to uh, make copies of it and glue things together instead of using the pointers. So like uh, complex, uh, in Julia, the complex numbers are immu uh, immutable. There's no way given a number one plus two i that you can change, like update, say the two i, make it three i. No, it's always one, that value is always one plus two i. Uh, and here's an exa yeah, e example, the, uh, the two levels deep on the, this i2, is because it's immutable, the compiler can lay everything out in line. And so I end up with this blob of bits. And the compiler is free to copy that blob of bits anytime it wants to. The, uh, so you worked on one of these really old Fortran compilers. It used to be that you had constants, like you could have a, a, a the, con the compiler would have like the constant 40, if you wrote 42 as a constant 42, it would actually store the 42 in some memory location and all the references to 42 would go through that memory location. And if you accidentally overwrote that memory location with 43, 42 everywhere in your program suddenly changed to 43. <laughs> it was really fun if you overwrote five or six because of the oh. output. <laughs> yeah. All went in, yeah. So yeah, just to summarize, the uh, compiler's knowledge of types the, uh, for parameters, the compiler knows the type exactly, usually. The, uh, it will clone a version of the function for, its ar for those particular argument types. So declaring the parameter types is useful to prevent accidents, but it won't actually speed up your code. And likewise, uh, global const variables, the compiler knows it. Local variables, the compiler is going to infer it. I'll say some more about that. I say fields of structures, as I've just been through, it's, it's as declared, and global variables, I'll say more about that, they're basically compiler doesn't do much right now. So, the important thing is be nice to type inference. It is the, the big performance problem. <coughs> Julia functions, by default, are polymorphic. They work on many different shapes of data. Hardware, at least most modern hardware, is monomorphic. Anybody else work on a Burroughs stack machine? They actually had hardware that was sort of po lightly polymorphic. Uh, and so the, and when the types are uncertain, the compiler has to box them, and the boxing causes heap allocation, requires garbage collection, at runtime dispatch, and stops inlining of calls. It slows things down. So here's an example of uh, type inference where it goes right. Here on the function on the left, I have the uh, simple a, a Julia function, and the code on the right is the LLVM code. And the compiler's been able to work, or, or LLVM code for when this function is invoked uh, on an int argument. 
When I spoke that int argument, everything's hunky-dory because the compiler can deduce that, hey, everything of interest is an int. Now if I go to the uh, code and I invoke the same code, this is the same example, but I invoke it on a float, float32, <laughs> I get a, a lot of code. And these are the red flags I was talking about earlier. If you see things, that, this JLPGC stack is a sign it's setting up some stack frame stuff. If I remember right, the exception handling? Uh, in JL box flow, well, that says what it, it's boxing something. And JL apply generic, it means it's time to do a fancy lookup to figure out where a function call needs to go. Let's see. All right, no, sorry, PGC stack, that, that's for garbage collected related stuff. So yeah, just because the difference is this quux, I give it an int, I get nice clean code, I hand it a float, and I get disastrous code. Yes. Well, the trouble is the y, actually, the, the, the trouble starts a little sooner. It's the uh, y equals x, y equals zero. So the y equals zero, uh, that zero is always int. zero that's an int. Yep. Even though other zeros that look the same sometimes become. Now, they're all, zero in Julia is always an int. Yeah, it needs to be zero points. Yeah. Point. You would have to use the GRO. Yes, I'll, 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 yeah, right. I'll, I'll get to that. If you did that, would you get the short form from the... Uh, yep, I'll show, I'll show it. The, uh, yeah, the root problem here is that this... Yeah, the, the, as Jeff, Jeffrey says, yeah, the, the, uh, the zero is always an int, but if x is a float, then I have this, this funny merge where what, the type of y depends upon which branch is taken. If the... X, if x is greater than or equal to zero, y is going to be the, the float, and if x is negative, y is going to be the int. And so that uh, makes the type of y uncertain. And the nice thing here, code warn type, uh, I didn't just color this in the slides. It actually colors it if you're on a multicolor display. So it'll color the y in red, and then down here, also color down here the the, the final sum, the y plus 1, it doesn't know what the type of y is, so the type of y plus 1, it doesn't know the type of that either. And if you're on a monochrome display, somehow the Julia system figures that out and prints it in the upper, it'll capitalize all the letters. So yeah, how to fix the code? Well, one way is to say, well, quarks A only really meant it to be applied to ints. Let's forget the float type and just put a type, type assertion in, and we're done. So the code's now, oh, and the term is, when all the types are known, it's called, the, the, the code is, particularly the return type, is called a, type, a function's type stable if the type of the result can be predicted from the type of the inputs and not having to know the values of the inputs. So quarks before was not type stable because it depended upon the value of x for the, for the float case, but we'll show how to make it type stable. Um, but here, one way to make something type stable is just to restrict the types it's going to be applied to. A better way is to uh, apply a conversion. This makes the code uh, polymorphic or generic. Here's four different ways to fix it, and depending upon circumstance or your taste, any of these will work. The uh, upper left, they use the zero function that returns a zero of the same type as x. Uh, upper right, same deal with zero, only there I'm using a form that takes a type as an argument. Uh, bottom left, that's using the convert function. Is it? Yeah. Wait, this one, I'm not sure. Somebody should check me on that way that actually works. I have a concern. I have a concern. All right. Uh, and the yeah, bo bottom right, you can use a, use a constructor. Now the zero, there's a function zero and there's a function, I think there's one. <laughs> Other constants, you pretty much have to use the, like the constructor form or something. There's, there's not like a function two and a half. 
OK, after the repair, the uh, code comes out looking fairly decent. OK, something to emphasize here. It's not that I was mixing integer and floating point arithmetic. That's not the problem. The problem is predicting the types. It, the, the type from, say, a float plus, a, a int plus a float, the compiler can predict what int plus float is. It's a float. And a float plus a uh, float plus complex, the result is complex. The compiler predict that. It's not mixing types. It's not being able to predict what a type is or having two different type, uh, type things assigned to the same instance of a, ver of a variable. So yeah, co code warn type here for this example, it, nothing in red. It all comes up clean. All right, the most common place, at least in my experience, for the, uh, the, the type instability problems is on reduction. And it's in initializing the accumulation variable with the value of the right type. Like here, I write a function that's going to tally up all the values in some collection. And it'll work fine for uh, type int, it'll work or sorry, a collection of type int, it'll work great. But for a type of the, uh, say, float, it's going to be a disaster because as soon as I do the, the s plus equals v the first time, well, s was initially an int, but when I do int plus float, I get float, and float assigned to s, and now s just switched from int to float, so the compiler knows it's going to have to box things. And so to avoid the boxing, the thing to do is you want to initialize your, your uh, accumulation variable with a zero of the correct type. So this is where the zero function is really handy. I'm just curious if I had a, um, an array or a vector that was a, a mixture of ints and floats and it was typed as any, and I handed it in the second form there, does that still work? Ooh, I don't know. I'll bet. I think it has to break. No, it would have to break. How could it possibly know what the zero? There, there is no an additive identity for any. Just that, that's too broad a request. <laughs> Even additive identity of real, I think, would give it a headache. All right. I'll write that. We'll do number, yeah. That's zero of number. It comes back to the integer zero and I evaluate that on the mm. plus. All right, here's just one more uh, a type stability example. Um, taking the roots of a quadratic equation. Uh, basically, a beginner, beginning programmer would say, well, okay, this example doesn't deal with a few of the corner cases. Okay, please give me a pass on that. No, actually, this is a hard, solving the quadratic equation with a piece of code is actually surprisingly hard if you really want to cover all the corner cases. Uh, but here, just uh, simple naive code. Here, uh, check the, compute the discriminant. If the discriminant is greater than or equal to zero, say, ah, I know the, exam the roots are real. I'll return real, a pair of real values. And then if the discriminant is negative, I return complex roots. It's nice, clean code, but now you've just poisoned your caller because the caller doesn't know whether the result's going to be real or complex, and that poison's just going to propagate through the system. So if I run code warn type, it actually point out the uh, that the result is a tuple of numbers, not a t uh, and number is a, 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 not a concrete type. It's abstract. Likewise, uh, the tuple then is not concrete. And so the solution is, well, when the discriminant is non-negative, you still want to return a complex-valued uh, solution. Just they're complex 
result where the imaginary part is zero. And yeah, it's, the results were real, but as far as the, the efficiency of the system, it'll be much improved that just you always return a complex value. All right, I so said, yeah, function, a function is type stable if you can predict the type of the result knowing all, the type of its arguments, not its values. So which of these are type stable? We got, okay, the first, how many people think the first one is type stable? Yeah, it's, it's type stable because it, 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 it's, it's got to return a zero or one, so it's always going to be an int. All right, the second one, the mi of x, is that type stable? Is it always, uh, how many people think it's always type stable? All right, nobody's going to, is it, what if I say, is it type stable? People aren't totally wacko about what negative x means. <laughs> yeah, it's type stable if, if people, if negative x returns the same type as x, yeah, it's under, it would be type stable. Uh, fa here, all right, is fa type stable? Yeah, it's probably hopeless. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so type stable. No, because yeah, X or Y, you, if they're different types, the result's going to be a different type. What about La, the last one? Is it type stable? Yeah. Yep, yeah. It's, so that's one way to force type stability sometimes is just, uh, uh, is just throwing a type parameter. A lot of times for function calls with a lot of like numerical arguments, where some of them you really want them to be the same type, or you'll go crazy anyway. And I was recently dealing with a code of lots of GCDs and mods. I was doing some Diophantine equations and like, these all better be the same way because I don't want to think too hard about the mixed mode case. And then if you really want to handle the mixed mode case, another way is to use uh, promotions. Like here, I can do two versions of law here. I, I can do one that takes a type parameter and forces both arguments to be the same type. Or sorry, not forces, but only works for arguments of the same type. And then I can define another one that works for any two arguments and I'll just promote the two arguments uh, to be the same type. So there's a, f a function in Julia called promote, you can read about the documentation. But what the codes here is doing is saying take x and y, promote them to a common type, and then call the other law function. Let's see, I'm going to say when we get to a break in the exercises, where am I? I think I'm close. Wait, where? Break. All right, let's go through this. Why wouldn't that promotion be automatic in a language? Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Cause not everybody wants it. <laughs> sometimes you want to break. Okay. Yeah, or sometimes you want to specialize. Like, okay, I, in the code I was mentioning the Diophantine things. Actually, the few cases I did distinguish between 32 and 64, because I knew only certain things would go up to 64 bits and. So yeah, the answer is it's an opt-in thing. Rah, whoa. All right, global variables. The current situation is, well, it's pretty sad and there's a, a GitHub issue on it. <laughs> there's no type inference for reassignable global variables because the compiler doesn't know whether they're gonna reassign things later and it doesn't currently try to like generate the code for the current type and maybe rejit if the type changes. It's been discussed fixing this, but and if you want to contribute a great optimization, go at it. <laughs> so the workarounds. One is don't use global variables. Um, somewhere people in their first using computer, doing computer programming and they hear the thing about global variables are bad, they go overboard and go crazy with that. Even hardcore C++ programmers, how many people pass C out all the way, or C error all the way down their call chains to everywhere they need it? Uh, declare a single uh, assignment global variables const, I'll show an example. There's a wrapper trick, there's a, uh, you can just type, uh, show an example using type checks or forcing conversion or a helper function trick. So yeah, here, here's the const. If you're only assigning the variable once, declare it const. 
So the code on the left will be fairly slow because beta is just a global variable. And the compiler doesn't know the type of beta, so when it gets to the comparison, it doesn't know which way the comparison's, what function's being used. If I declare uh, beta as const, the compiler knows it's never going to be assigned again, so it knows the type of beta is always going to be uh, float. In principle, it knows the value is always going to be 0.5, so it can forward propagate that everywhere like crazy. But I don't think the compiler currently does that, because it also has to track, like, everything has to invalidate. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Yes, there, there's a, a fine point there. Right. Right here, the 0.5, that's immutable. It's assigned to an immutable variable. So actually, in this case, the compiler could forward propagate it, but you're right. And I'll show an example where I'm using constant the, uh, on something where it couldn't forward propagate it. Shouldn't that be happening on the LLVM level? Um, if it's constant, it's strict, then it's Yes, if you told LLVM it's const. I don't know if we'd tell it or not. But right. We could, we could, uh, if we told LLVM it's const, it would happily forward propagate it. Okay, yeah, here's the, here's a bit of a const, and, and you have to be careful, because it's not the same as a C++ or C const, which people don't understand anyway, so. <laughs> uh, const just means the identifier is never rebound. It doesn't mean that the object is invariant. It just means that the identifier is not rebound. So, for example, I can write const a equals one, two, three, an array. Then I can push bang on a, no problem. I can assign all the zero to all the elements, no problem, because I have a is still that array. I'm changing the array. I'm changing the length of the array. I'm changing the elements of the array, but still the same array. I'm never rebinding a. On the other hand, on the other hand, if I try to rebound a to another array. On an interactive session, I get a warning that, hey, you're, you're cheating. <laughs> now, yeah, what the compiler, uh, and on the, the uh, right side, shows what the compiler can assume. It knows that the, uh, because it's const, it knows that the type of the object is always going to remain the same. That's the box in red. The type tag is constant, but it doesn't know the shape info is constant or that the user data is constant. <coughs> Okay, so you can use this trick as one way to avoid the overhead of uh, global variables, but still make immutable. So you can basically make a const reference. And this allows you, tells the compiler that the type is never going to change, but the value might change. So what I get out of that is, I get beta is a pointer. Well, the compiler knows it's always a constant pointer off to this, uh, a boxed, uh, well, right now the compiler's too, it, it, I think it always boxes it currently, but certainly semantically it behaves as if it was a boxed ref value. And then the O point, no, so the, the, the part in red is the part that the compiler knows will never change. The part in black is the stuff that could change. So I'm free to update that 0.5 as in the, uh, the bottom of the left side there. Okay, or another way is to use, yes, question. In the previous slide, I think on the bottom it should just be equals 0.5, so can you update to do that again? Oh, oh, ref, oh, you're right, you're right. That, that, that's a serious, that's a grievous error. That, that's a bad error. That needs to be fixed. Oops. <laughs> oh. I can teach my brain things, but my fingers sometimes don't <laughs> get it. All right. Let's see. All right. All right. Another way to deal with global variables is to use a type assertion. Here, the, the, the code on the left is uh, the slow version with the global reference. If you write an explicit type assertion after the load of the variable, that tells the compiler to check the type 
If it's not that type, uh, throw an exception. So the advantage of this approach is you get a runtime check for the uh, type of the variable. So there's a little bit of overhead, but it doesn't poison the rest of the computation with an unknown type. So the compiler knows that after that beta is loaded, it checks, oh yeah, it's a float 64. The type inference can figure out the rest of the types of the computation. So that gets you the, the performance back and still allows a global variable, but you lose some generality, um, as did the example with the... Uh, is it going to be confirming that beta is a float each and every time through the loop? It's, this gets down to how clever that compiler optimizer is. Semantically, it's checking every time through the loop. Yeah, if you hoist it by hand. Yeah, usually, right. If you're, gonna, if you're in this situation, it's probably better to hoist that by hand up out of the loop if the compiler won't do it. And I'm trying to remember now whether the uh, compiler won't do it because of the fault. Yeah, it takes, it takes some compiler trickery to get this to work, um, to get the compiler to hoist it. Trickery that I don't think is there yet. Yeah, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say, I'll get booed. I actually applied for a patent on something related to this. <laughs> Sorry, um, wh why doesn't Julia allow specifying type in the global space, like say something like beta, global, global float 64? Oh, yeah, I think it's been discussed, but it's never been, nobody's uh, belled that cow or whatever that. <laughs> Right now, yeah, there's, there's currently no way to uh, declare that. So the closest, if you're in that situation, the, the, the best thing is the, 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 the reference hack. Um, yeah, but then you have the square brackets everywhere. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Here, I'll show, there's, I'll show here, there's another ha hack if you want to micromanage the thing. Um, yeah, the, the final hack. All right, yeah, I, I lost generality here. The, uh, okay, the helper function hack. I have the, the, the slow version. Let's see, should I get this? Okay, what I do is I break my function into two parts. I, I load, and, and the, in the call chain, the first part is I, I load the global variable as a parameter and then call the function that does the real work. In this case, on the right, the foo aux. So you see that the foo is just a little helper function there. And its purpose in life is it takes the x that I wanted and the, uh, it loads, its purpose in life is to load beta into a generic dispatch. Then the dispatch will call foo aux. And at that point, I'll get a foo aux that's customized to specific types of uh, beta at that moment. And then I do my real work in the foo aux and it runs nice and fast. Let's see, and I want to make one other point about this trick. This Let's see, sometimes people try to fix this by oh, using an explicit convert. And that doesn't quite work unless, what is it? Oh. The compiler can't, it can't infer the result type of convert unless it can infer the types of both arguments. So in this example, beta, it doesn't know the type of beta because it's global, and therefore it can't, even though it looks like it should be able to uh, infer the result of convert, uh, it can't. Um, now we know idiomatically convert is always used in a particular way where in principle it could figure out the type, the result type, because it's, it's L type of X. But convert is not treat, given any special treatment in the language. It's just another Julia function. And maybe some evil person overloaded it in some way to, so it behaves funny. All right, now type assertion, that's the other way out. You can uh, 
if you do the convert and then you slap a type assertion saying, yes, it really is this type. If it's not, please throw an exception. Then you can look, uh, force uh, the B, variable B here to have a, a known type. All right. Okay, I want to say, oh, here, call, uh, Let's say L type O. Oh. Yeah, now I forgot what this means. <laughs> if you call a type with an argument that's the same as converting the argument. Yeah. So yeah, you can call okay, yeah, element type element type conversions you can Shorten up by writing it just element type of the uh, argument. So just yeah, the type guidelines for Julia. Julia specializes functions to the parameter types. So type declarations on parameters really don't help performance. You use them for overload resolution or to protect yourself against accident. I think it's still at least I'm very sloppy and careless. So I, use, I need all the help I can get. So I usually type my pre, uh, arguments to functions narrowly as I can. Uh, now type inference, it, it does uh, forward flow, uh, Julia does forward flow analysis. And if it can't deduce a, t a concrete type for something, it can be in trouble because when it, if you call a function on a non-concrete type and it can't, if it can't deduce the result type, then it kind of chains onwards at that point, and the, the unknownness of the type propagates forwards to, through other calls. The, uh, so particularly look out for, if you have a variable that's assigned on multiple paths, make sure the same type is assigned on all those paths. And yeah, code warn type will, will point out the lack of concrete types. It'll color them red on a, a color display, and I think it's all caps on monochrome. And avoid using global variables and kernels unless they're const. And you use that ref, the, the ref hack or the, uh, the helper function. All right, now I have a break. Uh, I have a bunch of exercises that can be downloaded. Um, feel free to take a break and come. Wait, 10 minutes enough or? Fifth, B want 15. I said 10's enough? 10's enough. All right. So we're reconvening at 1040. Tax form that, number. That was really but, helpful. Okay. All right. The, the, the alternating sum just has the, the, the gotcha is that it has a initialized a, an accumulator with a zero, hard zero, and that really needs to be uh, adjusted for the type of the uh, argument. So at least my, my, my fix was to look at the element type of the array and generate a zero of the correct type. I know it's there, the, that's for, for the sum S. For C, I don't have to do anything, because C, I'm just, what, I'm just alternating it plus and minus. So I know it starts out of one, an integer, and it's just going to keep flip-flopping between one and minus one. All right, and exercise, and yeah, problem two, yeah, it's an easy gotcha if you're, used, if you're coming from the C and Fortran world. Division on integers in Julia returns the correct answer. <laughs> Unlike those other languages. If you really want to do, do integer, in, uh, the, the div, you gotta call it div. Just like, uh, well, I guess what, Pascal. So uh, yeah, as it originally was written, it's the type, the, the function h is unstable because it returns the, on, on one branch, it returns a, a, a floating point value, and on the other branch, it returned an integer value. And by replacing the divide by two with a div, and now get integer result on both, bran both arms of the branch. Where are we slides for? 
Right, the, the type stability is probably the biggest uh, impact on performance and the easiest one to slip on. So running the, the functions I showed, the, 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 the warn, particularly the uh, code warn type is useful for spotting the, the type instabilities. But there's still some more gotchas, and these are similar to uh, other languages that have less elaborate type systems. One is reusing objects instead of reallocating them can still speed up codes. Now, the new garbage, o point, uh, the impact is much less than it was with Julia 0.3. Uh, Julia 0.4 has a, it's a generational collector. So generational collectors work on the principle that most objects die young, so it keeps two separate. Objects are placed in two categories and new objects are put in the, the new category until they sit around long enough and then they're put in the old category and there's ways in the garbage collection algorithms to speed stuff up if you know you're dealing with mostly just new objects. So, but particularly big arrays, you, you can speed things up by reusing them. The, for example, here I have a, a, a this is a cellular automaton it takes an, uh, coming in, uh, variable S is a array of cell states, and then I'm going to generate the next uh, state of it by, with a variable T. And so in Julia, it is, it's convenient. I can take the input array S, I can say, yeah, I want something of the similar type and, and shape. And I can up, update it, and there, there's the code. This is basically a, a one-dimensional uh, cellular automaton. And then if I want to evolve this automaton over several, uh, several generations, I have this function evolve at the bottom, it just counts the number of time steps I want to go through and it updates each one. Now the and, and so next state, it takes in a state, it kicks out a state, it, it looks fine, only it's, it'll be, the trouble is I'm constantly creating new, each, each call to the next state is allocating a new array, that, that array T, and throwing out the old array. So I can do much better if I uh, hang on to both, uh, keep two arrays around and use one for the old state, one for the new state, and then swap them. So the code on the right does this. Instead of returning, uh, creating an array internally and returning it, it takes an array as an argument, or it, it takes two arrays as arguments, one for where the data's coming from and one where the new data's gonna go into. And now I just, destructively update it. And then my function evolve, I'm careful to, I, I allocate two arrays and then I feed them in, one is the old state, one's a new state, and then I swap them. Uh, so this sort of optimization, maybe I don't do it the first time I develop the code. I mean, first I worry about getting things right, but after I've got it put together, I might go back and uh, fix this. Now, I said, uh, uh, Julia 0.4, the, uh, the garbage collector's gotten much faster, so this sort of thing is perhaps less of a concern. I haven't timed this uh, specific example lately. It's much less of a concern than it was with Julia 0.3. Ah, uh, yes, comprehensions. Um, the comprehension syntax is convenient. It's, it's syntactically convenient, but it's, uh, it can be slow. Oh, let's see, what was it? I'm trying to remember what the gotcha here is. Hang on, do I have a slide here? Oh, because I, I haven't told it what the return type is here. And I'm not sure what the current, actually, I haven't run this example lately, uh, the latest Julia, but the catch is deducing the return type. The, uh, if I don't put the, the, the red ink there, the compiler is not necessarily certain as to what the return type is. Now, I maybe 0.4 is better, but the, uh, by putting the, saying here, I want the result type to be the same type as the uh, element type of, the, of S here, 
I'm telling the compiler, yes, I, I want the array of this very definite type. As in general, I would avoid just, just the, the bracket, creating an array with just the brackets with no, not saying what the result type is. I, I tend to avoid that because I, I don't know what I'm getting. Why is that different than you know, having it do, you know, the, the type of that would do the a function or any other expression there? Like I'm trying to remember now. I think the catch is it's, dest it's a destructive assignment. Oh, gosh, I, I need a real a hardcore expert. I've, Oh, that may be part of it. Yeah, the zero length array. So that, the, the expression on the left hand side, you know, everything between the open square bracket and the four. The, the keyword for yeah, that, uh, that expression should have a known type. Yeah, it has a known type. Unless the yeah, I'm not I think the problem is the zero length. Maybe the yeah, the zero length issue. Um Let me write that down as a question to resolve later. Um, what's that slide 66? To make it what? Deduce the type or? Like if it's zero length, then you do like type inference and else you just use ah. the Ah, okay. All right, and there's two, yeah, there's, uh, there's basically, uh, particularly doing numerical work, there's, uh, there's, well, there's three styles you can write Julia in. There's at least, there, there's two for just general work, and there's a third if you're doing numerics. The uh, array, array style coding, you write whole array operations. It's like if you've done Fortran 90 or APL, uh, where you operate, each operation operates on an entire array. And it's in Julia it's sometimes called the, the vectorized style. So here I'm computing delta on the, on the left, delta w is equal to, well, I have an array w minus an array, I'm pulling what it's uh, one column of w minus another column. I'm doing the subtraction element wise, and then I'm doing some plus equals updates. And it's, uh, the style is very convenient, and the optimization is getting a lot better about this. Uh, the, the gap between the array style and the loop style is it's getting narrower, but it, it's still there. The loop style is well, good old, like good old Fortran 77, where I just write out the loop with, and subscripts. That is still the, uh, the faster approach for the most part in, in Julia. In this code, oh yeah, this is, this is actually a piece out of piece, uh, uh, on the right, the, the fast version, it's out of a, or adapted from a contest code. I use Julia um, actually get, get second place. I was up against people using C++ and other fancy stuff. And you know when I was playing around this a year ago, there was like a DVEC macro. So yes, there's still, still, I think, the, yeah, the DVEC. Still floating around. Is there a goal to make Julia actually do the devectorization? I, style? I haven't been following the current discussions on that. Yeah, I, I, I think the, they, they've been working on trying to, I know they're trying to get the array style to run faster. Um, so the, the gap's been closing, but I, I haven't been following it closely as to it. Probably because I'm just lazy and I just say, ah, I'm going to go write it, scalar, scalar code, and be done with it. So the other way, if you're dealing with stuff that's linear algebra, sometimes you really just want to call the blahs to do the, the cycle intensive part. Yeah, but then you have to be a BLAS expert to know that, oh yeah, this call, oh, that's a GER. Like, I didn't know that until I really looked hard. Like, I think I created this exa exact example backwards by first looking through the BLAS, <laughs> find something obscure I didn't know, and then write out the code. So that does, I think that is the update from the contest code, though. Yeah. GER stand for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, because the, the blahs are all like six-letter identifiers because of the old Fortran restrictions, so they're real fun. Uh, so, 
at least my style is, I use the array style if it's convenient and I don't care about the performance. Um, it is going to have the, uh, the allocation overhead. And it's going to have, oh, the other issue, um, it, it's going to have poor cache behavior. If my arrays don't fit inside the cache in the, on the machine, say that's about four megabytes of memory. If it spills out, it doesn't fit in cache, it's going to be coming out of main memory. So like if I do A plus, two big matrices that don't fit in cache, A plus B, the result's not going to fit in cache. Now I say add in C. It's got to pull it back out of main memory and into cache, add in C, kick it back out into main memory, then add, say, in matrix D. It brings it back in the cache, kicks it out. Basically, I lose all the advantages of having the cache memory. Uh, whereas the loop style, I can glom everything together and keep my so-called the working set, the, the data I'm working with uh, recently small, I can pull, keep all that in the processor's cache. And then if I can call the blahs, that's even better yet, because somebody's already sweated all these issues for me. Let's see, anything else I want to say? Okay, and there's the old, a link is good about, uh, opti about array style versus scalar style versus, I think that has, that's about the, the, vector, the, the vectorized macro, or de sorry, de the devectorized macro. And think the, the gap is closing. It, it's better with 0.4 than 0.3 in a, I haven't been following lately, but I certainly hope 0.5 is closer, but. All right. Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, 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 I yeah. mean on the, on the upper left? Yes. Pre-allocate, yeah, you can pre-allocate delta W um, and pass it into the caller, and there I, I write delta W open bracket colon comma colon, or how many, what's the rank of it? Sorry, it's, it's rank one. So it'd be delta W open bracket colon close bracket. And to do a destructive, yeah, update. Just like I'm updating C, uh, the two, uh, which are those columns of CM, destructively updating them in place. So yes, that, that's a way to avoid, avoid the allocation. So one thing is, don't get too hung up on efficiency for every little thing. It's like, profile your code first and then worry about the parts where the time is being spent. I think it's, uh, tomorrow I'm talking about a piece of code. I wrote it all in Go, but 95% of the code time it was spent in 5% uh, of the code, so then I read a little Julia script to crank out the <laughs> code that counted for performance. So yeah, there's three kinds of optimizations. There's, or at least I, I think of there's three kinds. There's automatic where the compiler just does it, you don't have to think about it, it's, that's nice. Then there's kinds, well, it wasn't quite automatic, but if you just give the compiler a little nudge or remove a little nit that was getting in its way, it takes care of the rest. And then there's the manual stuff, where you, you have to do it yourself and uglify your code to some degree. So yeah, with optimizations, there's always two key, key questions. The, because uh, you're taking code and transforming it into a different piece of code. Is the transform, is it le always legal? Is what you rewrote it as really the same, do the same thing as the original code, or is it close enough? Sometimes these are, is it legal is a fuzzy question, particularly with floating point round off. Maybe you change the floating point round off and maybe that's okay and maybe it is uncool. And is the transform, is it likely profitable? Did you really, does it speed things up in the average case? Uh, you'll go crazy if you worry about speeding things up for all possible cases, but does it speed things up in the cases you care about? So I'll try to go, I'll go through some of these optimizations and what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get apart is which ones you should do by hand and which ones you're just uglifying your code and the compiler could have done it better anyway. Or which ones, some of these, you're getting in the way of the compiler. So constant propagation, if you declare a variable as const, the compiler is pretty good about it for the cases where it matters. So here's an example. Um, 
So what, I have A is 2, and I declared that as const, so that's really, I hit the compiler over the head saying that's const. But also here I have x equals a plus 1. Well, the compiler knows a is const. It knows it's 2. It knows 1 is, well, 1 is 1. So 2 plus 1 is 3. It, it can figure that out and forward propagate the, figure out what the value of x is and forward it just fine for integers. And then I have, uh, oh, down there, i plus x plus 4. A little further down. Not sure I turn this on. You see on the left, uh, I have i plus x plus 4. There, there's actually, um, the compiler can take care of it because it knows that, well, the value of x is 3, and I'm adding integers so I can reassociate the arithmetic, so I can fold the 3 into the 4, and it comes out i plus 7. And that's the same as on the else branch, so everything's hunky-dory. The code comes out nice and sweet. Um, now, floating point's a little trickier because Julia, by default, prefers delivering accuracy, or at least delivering what you asked for, as opposed to delivering something fast that might be slightly off from what you asked for. So if you do the floating point version of this code, you'll find that it, the code is more complicated, the, 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 uh, the object code is more complicated because, yes, the compiler could do the, the, the plus the first part, the a, it knows a is 2, it knows 2 plus 1 is 3, but when I ask for i plus x plus 4, the, uh, I have to add the x to i first, and I have to add the 4. And it turns out with floating point, if I add, the, the, it's not associative all the time. And the compiler doesn't, can't risk that it's going to deliver a different answer by default. So it actually will add the 3 and then add the 4. And so the, so if you want to, the point is here, floating point addition is not associative, and so the compiler will not reassociate stuff by default. So, so one way to fix this is you can explicitly group stuff. So here I've put, added some parentheses, so I say do the x plus 4 first, knowing that, well, x is probably coming in as a constant, and then the compiler is free to It'll see that x is 3, and then x plus 4 is 7, and simplify the code. Now, there's also a macro, I think I'll show it later, this uns it? Uh, unsafe math, or fa no, fast math, that gives the compiler liberty to play games, or play games that give slightly different answers. So, some rules for floating point that are uh, unsafe, un uh, things are Algebraically obvious, but unsafe for floating point. Adding zero to a value is, doesn't just return the same value because the, uh, there's some called negative zeros in the floating point. Negative zero plus zero is uh, zero, if I remember right. And likewise, multiplying by zero does not necessarily give you zero because zero times infinity is uh, not a number in IEEE floating point. Dividing by a constant is not the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. You get small differences in the last bit or two um, for certain values. So that one's sometimes tricky. I mean, the, the difference is, it would be in like the last bit, and it's actually, I think I launched, to find the exa example where three and five, I launched like a brute force search. The uh, floating point addition is not associative. It's almost, but there's examples where the result will be slightly off by what, usually just the very last bit will be wrong. And likewise, the distributive law doesn't apply to floating point addition. So, so if you want your code optimized using these rules, either you've got to do it by hand or use the uh, macro fast math. Now, some people despair and say, huh, everything I learned in school doesn't work with floating point. But no, actually, some things still work. Uh, this is right, don't, don't, it's not totally hopeless. Uh, particularly if you ignore so-called signaling not a numbers. There's these things that almost nobody implements these days in any language, because everybody found them to be, I think, a pain in practice. But there's these values that say, I'm not a number, and if you ever hit, do, do arithmetic on me, throw an exception. But I think most people have basically given up on these. 
it's been a while since I've run into an active case of a signaling man. Anyway, adding negative zero um, still gives you x. Notice it's a negative zero, not a positive zero. <laughs> there are two different values in IEEE floating point. Multiplying by one is still good. The uh, dividing by, you can replace the division by multiplying by the reciprocal if you're dealing with a power of two. Addition is still commutative. Multiplication is still commutative. You think this is dumb? You think somebody would ever put together a machine with non-commutative addition or multiplication? Well, check out your old TI, what was it, 59 or 58 calculators? They used to store, it's like because they uh, didn't use a stack and they needed to store a little bit of extra information to deal with order of operations, they stored it in like the low order digit that you couldn't see off on the right side of the number. <laughs> so you get funny non-commutative eff effects. Uh, let's see, the negative of a negative, yeah, that rule's good. And, oh, yeah, the very last rule is very important. This is the definition of subtraction in IEEE arithmetic. It must work. Okay, the macro fast math. The macro fast math says, eh, take some liberties. We don't care about round off too badly. So you wrap some code in a fast math, and the compiler has liberty to reassociate things. Uh, apply algebraic rules that were true in what you learned in algebra in grade school. It may be slightly off for floating point. Mark, what about fuse multiply add? This fast math gives you, yes, liberty to use fuse. Mul I, think it, I think it gives liberty to use fuse multiply add. But, basically, but if you don't use fast math, you're just No, you're not going to see it. Unless you use, let's see, I'm trying to think, are there any other exceptions? Only if you have integer arithmetic. If you use multiply, it's still legal for in integers, but you're right. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the big M modern architectures. You can't, without the fast math, you lose the... the if you use multiply add, it's like the computer can, in a single instruction can do A times B plus C and do it with only one rounding error. But because it's actually, perversely, because it's more accurate than what you asked for, it's not legal for the machine to automatically substitute it. Uh, I mean the, the that you're not going to automatically have oh gosh I'm trying to remember I, th I think LLVM will never oh where are you? I don't remember now how LLVM deals with it I think there's a flag I think they check a flag or something to determine whether they're allowed to reshuffle stuff Is which? Oh, oh, that's right. There's a flag in the op, in the add instruction. And so, yeah, LLVM it gives it, the program is a choice in the, in the intermediate representation as to whether the, whether a, each operation is sloppy or not. So, yeah, in general, the, the rule for algebra is, yeah, the compilers are very good about rearranging integer arithmetic. They know everything you learned in grade school and probably things you didn't learn in grade school, at least for, for integers. For floating point, the, uh, much of the algebraic rules you learned in grade school are just, they're, they're unsafe. They return slightly different answers. So by default, they're off in Julia. Julia stresses the uh, accuracy and predictable results. And if you want the, uh, all those rules you learned in grade school to be applied, you mark things with fast math. And sometimes you don't need fast math. You just, uh, I had that other example. Just by re putting parentheses in the right place and reassociating arithmetic, you can get the faster answer. In general, if you have a loop and you have a whole bunch of things, say you're adding up, you want to group the things that are loop invariant uh, together and add those first, and then maybe that sum will be hoisted out instead of the other way around where you have some loop variant part and you're adding in this value and then this value and then this value and then this value. So those who think they know everything about integer arithmetic, um, the bottom is a puzzle. What do those functions do? Anybody seen those before? Or did the last, <laughs> 
Anyway, same. And you can always. It's, and, yeah, but there's a simpler way to say it. <laughs> yeah, it's. I always have to run, run through. I, I, I know there's two functions these correspond to, but I never know which is which until I run an example through my head. <laughs> let's see, f of zero is. Let's see, I flip it. Yeah, f is add one, and g is subtract one. Okay, inlining. Um, uh, I didn't get around to updating the slide. Okay, replaces the call site with a copy of the callee's body. Normally, the, the, uh, it's, it's legal as long as the correct callee can be determined. If the compiler can determine exactly what, what function is being called, it's always legal to do it. If the compiler can't determine it, it's trickier. Uh, now, if it's inlining profitable. It saves the overhead of the calling convention. That's actually some of the cost, but that's actually usually not the big win these days. Gosh, the processor has such fast call instructions. And the, uh, the big win is usually from the further specialization of the callee. If the compiler knows it's calling the callee with particular arguments, particularly if some of the arguments are constant, the compiler can do all sorts of specialization of that uh, callee. Maybe, uh, and maybe even eliminate some branches. Now the catch is if you inline too much stuff, you can create a really monster piece of machine code that doesn't fit in cache and then you, you lose big time if it, the machine has to constantly fetch instructions uh, out of main memory instead of cache. So here's an example. Here's an example where I, I'm pretty sure the, the compiler does it automatically. The, uh, but just to show what inlining does. Here I have a, a function f and a function g. And if I look at the, the code for g, it's just uh, calling f. Where's the end we went? Yeah, there, there's a, all right. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's calling f. And the, uh, there's no inlining yet. And after the compiler does inlining, it takes the f and in, uh, copies the definition of f into the body of g and expands it. And you get quite a mouthful of code. And the compiler then, let's oh, some examples here. This one, yeah, it's a small win as far as saving call overhead, but it's not the, the, the big win. The big win is often when there's a, a, one of the arguments is constant. So for example here, um, uh, g of x is calling f of x, but the second, or f of x comma two, and the compiler spits out a nice short piece of code because it knows it's dividing by two and there's a bunch of LLVM magic that knows it can reduce division by, well, oh, that's division by two and then multiplying back by two. That's the same as clearing the low order bit. So inlining basically puts stuff together or by taking a call chain and gliding it all into one piece of, uh, one function that allows the optimizer to optimize everything within that function without having to look across functions. And now for some reason studying the code, you want to disable inlining or just for kicks, look how slow the code runs. You can turn off inlining uh, on the command line when, when you invoke Julia. I don't think I've ever had reason to do that. And now sometimes the compiler won't inline stuff that you wanted inlined. Now, Usually, the heuristics are pretty good. I, I've had few, uh, few cases where I've really wanted to do this because I'm uh, uh, very paranoid about the problem where if you over inline, you blow, uh, things no longer fit in the instruction cache. But sometimes you know better, or at least think you know better, and you can try it. If, the, if it slows down the code, you know you made a mistake. So here, the, uh, an example, yeah, you put at inline in front of the uh, function to be inline. It's like C++ or C99 in its inline keyword in its effect. It says inline this function. So it's, in this example, it's not a big win because you had to save some call overhead, but it uh, doesn't do much. The big win for inlining is when uh, one of the arguments is a constant. Then the compiler can do this called constant propagation and simplify the call E. I 
I think it's, gosh, the Julia in-law, anybody know? I think it, does it ever refuse? I don't know. Yeah, if it gets silly, yeah, large things. I, I haven't tried to abuse it to that point. I, I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it should be in mind, but there's some parts where it sometimes fails in mind anyway. But then I should yeah. try it. You know, so some, some, with the current Julia 2, you can sometimes slow down code um, significantly. The, uh, here's an example. Uh, this actually speeds up with no inline. Oh, sorry, and this is where it's not that I slowed it down asking for inlining, it's that the compiler's automatic inlining slows things down. And this is, it, it's a, there's a bug report on th this issue, but it's, it's not fixed yet. But here's where I actually speed up the code with a no inline directives. And what the, the problem is if it inlines it, the, uh, the cosine and the sine calls there. If it inlines it, the, uh, what is it? It doesn't know the types yet because of the way that the type dispatch what's it work. Yeah, foo here. It's calling f on a sub i. It doesn't know the type of a sub i, so it's going to do this dynamic dispatch thing for each call to f. If I don't inline it, I just do dynamic dispatch on the call to f. If I inline it, I have dynamic dispatch the cosine and the square uh, to raise the two, and dynamic dispatch the sine, and because it doesn't know the result type of that, dynamic dispatch the squaring. So it's I pick up four dynamic dispatches instead of one. So, so occasionally, I mean, you, usually the system guesses these things right. I've had very little reason to. Right. Basically, yeah. Right. That's it's forcing the ba the, the boundary. In most of my experience, that usually picks the boundary right. But yeah, if you really want to force it, yeah, you put no inline, and then maybe you put inline down the rest of the call chain. Though I think the compiler would get it in the cases that it pays off. Okay, bounds checking. The uh, Julia checks array subscripts by default. There's a small overhead for that. It's actually not too bad uh, in most cases. It's only like for a tight loop, I, I measured it at like 10%. It's not a big thing because modern processors can do so much checking out of order and they speculatively execute stuff ahead of time in the hardware. So it's not as big a deal as one might think, except the bounds checking turns off vectorization and that can be a big hit. So I'm using vectorization there to mean uh, using SIM, SIMD instructions. The, uh, so yeah, here's a function, and you can see the over the uh, the code generated for the bounds checking. I mean, it, it looks really scary because it, it generates all these comparisons. It, it basically subtracts one from the subscript to turn it into a zero origin subscript, then compares against a, a, a bound using an unsigned comparison. It's this hack that basically compares against two. It's, it flips the the. Uh, I would say, by doing this check, you can do it with one check instead of two checks. It achieves the effect of checking, is it greater than or equal to one and less than the bound, but doing it with a single branch. But anyway, the, the point is, it, it, there is a branch, but the hardware is pretty good about burying these things. Except that also, it, it turns off the ve uh, any op automatic vectorization opportunities. So sometimes it pays off to turn off the, uh, the bounds checking. And you can do this a couple different ways. One is in the code, and this is the way I, I, I do it, is I, I put an explicit at inbounds macro, and that turns off all the subscript checking inside it. Inside it. Now, you, you better be right on your subscript, so you may trash your memory. Um, be just like good old C and C++. The, uh, and, now, and you can also, there's command line controls that can flip things both directions, you say check bounds equals yes, then it uh, just uh, 
Wait, I don't like the way I've written that slide. Check bounds equals yes basically does, checks the bounds, oh yeah, checks the bounds everywhere and just ignores the at inbounds command. So if you have a code that's crashing, you think, oh gosh, maybe I messed up with the inbounds and something really wasn't inbounds. You put this on the, put check bounds on the command line and the, uh, do a run and see if you get any exceptions thrown that you weren't expecting, out, out of bounds exceptions. And at the other extreme, if you think, oh gosh, is the bounds checking slowing down my code? Maybe I, could I speed things up by writing at inbounds everywhere? Well, before you go do that, run it with check bounds equals no. Now turn off all the bounds checking and see if your code speeds up. Maybe it only speeds up slightly or not at all and say, yeah, not worth it. No, no point in sprinkling the uh, at inbounds in the code anyway. Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. I think you can scope it pretty much. So if it bounds turns off vectorization, does that mean that all vector operations done by automatic vectorization in Julia are masked? Sorry, all inbounds, the, sorry, which, the, the sorry. oh, oh, the lack of inbounds, if has the bounds checking turns off vectorization. No, it's not, it won't vectorize right now if it has to do the check. That, that's where, where I'm headed is, yeah, you, right now you have. So wait a minute, does bounds checking always turn on vectorization or just sometimes? Uh, always right now as far as I know. It's a, in fact, I think it's on my list of, if you're looking for a Julia project, I got one for you because I, <laughs> I had a sketch just a couple different lines of attack on this problem. All right, let's see. Oh, another, okay, a, a small speed issue. Um, sometimes, if you're really going after the last few cycles and, and, and your code involves truncating integers, there's two ways to do it. There's a, you can do an explicit cast, and that does a checked conversion. If, if the number doesn't fit, you'll get an exception. Or you can do a modulo conversion where it just takes the low order bits and runs with them, whatever those may be. So for example here, yeah, int 8 of minus 200, it doesn't fit, throws an exception. Whereas minus 200 percent int 8, it just says, ah, we're going to force fit it. So you're going to take the low order 8 bits and run with them. You see that minus 200 is equal to 56 modulo the low order 8 bits. Okay, hoisting invariance. Yeah, this is, at least to me, the, the most frustrating issue with the current level optimization in Julia is that the compiler sometimes does it, and other times you have to do it manually, and maybe in the future we'll get to a point where the compiler does it a lot better. But the key uh, problem in hoisting an invariant is, is it always legal? And that often depends on alias analysis. As our, our two, al aliases are when two variables with different names refer to the same object. So here's an example. The, uh, I have x and y, they're declared as vector of t, and I write a piece of code. And let's see, where am I? The, the question is, can the, uh, it, it looks like, yeah, two, which is, oh, 2a plus 1, where am I going with this? Now this, this field, let's see, A, do, 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 do. Yeah, the, the 2A plus 1, um, the compiler will hoist that in mo most cases just fine. Like I pass in 3 there, uh, if the floating, or call it a floating point, it, it does fine. Now the catch is with, with uh, the, the problem is fields. The uh, X and Y there, oh, oh, this was the point of it. Okay, sorry, I'm getting X, Y, yeah, the, the code here generated, there'll be, a, the, the, the B dot X, the, the problem is that, that there's a couple levels of indirection. I should have provided a picture here. But the B dot X is in effect a, a pointer to a vector of T. And the, uh, and each time through the loop, it'll keep loading, loading this pointer. And again, it 
to tell the compiler to do that. Right, right now, you pretty much have to tell the compiler explicitly. Oops. So here, to help the compiler, when I'm dealing with a, a field of, a, of, a, of a, 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 a structure type, I usually explicitly load them into local variables before I call my, uh, my loop that's doing the heavy work. Now, the 2a plus 1, I'm fine there. The 2a plus 1, it's a, a is a lo, uh, local variable. Uh, the compiler can figure out, can see all its, see whether it's modified or not. And it, you can see that it's not modified in this example, so it knows that 2a plus 1 is loop invariant, it can hoist it out. But the, the x and the y, it, it can't see as well. Particularly, it's concerned about y and x here, oh yeah, could refer to the same vectors, the perverse thing. And the compiler can't figure out that they don't. Or not yet. <laughs> so I normally, when doing with, the, yes? But what if, bar, what if I construct the immutable bar but hand it references to the same vector? Don't you have the same problem now when you use variables? Don't you have the same oh, 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 this is the same, sorry. Yeah, you, you're right, you're right. Maybe you know, no, you're right. I, I was getting my head of my stuff. I, I'm getting it into the, the vectorization issue. No, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, my, my advice is yeah, don't bother hoisting the local scalar stuff. The compiler can do that. Like my, the, uh, the, the local scalar stuff in the example was this, uh, the 2a plus 1. It's local. It's scalars. It's local. The compiler will deal with it. But do worry about these, uh, the fields of composite types. Though it's pointed out, if, if it's immutable, the compiler can, can, can do something about the hoisting. And the compiler's yeah, getting better. OK, unrolling loops by hand. This one <laughs> always annoy, it annoys me, because the compiler's actually pretty good about it, and it really uglifies the code. And some optimizations require re-rolling the loop, and I don't think LLVM's there yet. I know the Intel compiler will re-rolls a lot of loops to deal with this sort of thing. So given the, uh, the original loop here, the, uh, that loop on the left will, will vectorize just fine. But the loop on the right, somebody's thought, oh yeah, I'll speed it up because I've heard unrolling is great. Um, and it was on older compilers, but the, uh, so they so-called do a partial unrolling where they unroll so it executes four iterations at a time and have a remainder loop. This will, st the, the Julia vectorizer can deal with the code on the left. It, it can't deal with the code on the right. And it, it'll remain sc scalar code. Is this the Julia vectorizer or LLVM? Or the LLVM vectorizer. If you want to do this right, uh, in a vectorizer, you do like the Intel compiler's vectorizer. It re-rolls the loop back. It, it, it turns the, the form on the right back into the left. And then it runs the vectorizer. Remember the old KAI vectorizer, I used to work for uh, Cook and Associates, yeah, they had the same deal. There was a, something called, what was it, re-roll was the name of the pass. So in general, I, I advise against manual unrolling. Let the JIT do it. In most cases, it knows. The, un, the optimal unroll factor depends upon the hardware. So it will differ depending upon the target machine. It also depends upon the instruction latencies and the instruction queue size. It basically, the optimal unroll factor depends upon these awful machine detailed things that you don't want to have to learn. And they're going to change. As soon as you get running on one machine, they're going to change the rules for the next machine anyway. And also, it, it, it just makes the car code harder to read. Um, occasionally, yeah, you can surely come up with an example where you beat the compiler. But for the most part, it makes the code hard to read, and it's going to thwart the, uh, the vectorizer that's usually going to do a better job these days. Uh, 
Okay, key point though in writing loops, and so they can be vectorized, is that uh, the Julia rays are column major. Algol and its descendant, Algol, C, C++, Pascal, all row major languages where each row is stored consecutively in memory. But Julia traces back to MATLAB, to Fortran, and goes to column major, which I think even the inventors, even Backus, John, uh, John Backus, one of the inventors of Fortran, agreed was a mistake, but it's, <laughs> they're stuck with it. <laughs> so, if you have an array of floating point values, they're stored, the values are stored consecutively in memory as columns. So unit stride in memory, those consecutive addresses is vertical. And a cache line, a collection of 64 bytes on uh, Intel machines. And on other machines, it's going to be 32 or 128 or 64. It's, the, the cache lines are little vertical chunks. So if you take an array, and you traverse it horizontally, you're bringing in a lot more memory than you, what you might think you're bringing in, because you're not bringing in those little dots. You're bringing in the cache lines for those dots. So you're bringing in that. You're bringing in, if that's an array of bytes, you're bringing in 64 times more stuff than you thought you were bringing in. So it really pays off to traverse the arrays. Uh, on the innermost loop, traverse it vertically along columns so when you bring in a chunk, a cache line for a column, you can work on all of the cache line and not have to go back and refetch it later, as is the case when you're working on rows. So just uh, some short, uh, short example here. An example on the left, it increments the elements of a matrix the slow way, and the slow way is, well, what Gosh, it's tough. If you're a C or C++ programmer, it's like force of habit. You always write the rightmost subscript as your innermost thing. But here you want the, the leftmost the subscript to be the fast one. So the fix for on the upper right, uh, yeah, upper right, all I've done is swap the uh, iteration order. So you really want the, the fastest subscript. The, the, the innermost one on the iterations wants to be the leftmost subscript. And then, yeah, Julia 0.4, the, the new feature, the uh, each index feature sort of takes this out of your hair for simple loops. You just say, I want to iterate over all indices in the array A, and it'll do it in the right order, and you don't have to worry about it. I haven't used each index a lot. There's probably more bells and whistles on it for like doing subarrays. But so you don't say translate. Uh, okay. There's also there's another. There's not only this notion of cache memory, but the uh, the thing that translates the the page, uh, memory is grouped in pages, and the, the pages are mapped onto. Di uh, they're like about four kilobytes, and each page is, uh, when you pull something in, code in, uh, data in from cache, it uh, pulls in the whole, or sorry, not cache, from disk, it pulls in the whole four kilobytes, the whole page at once. And the mapping of the, from the pages to the addresses occupies this thing called the translation look aside buffer. And if you, uh, have stuff scattered all over, memory on different pages, if you run out of translation look aside buffer entries, uh, things slow way down. So you case have to be careful to give some thought to that, particularly for very large matrices. If you're traversing a large matrix, you really want to do it column wise, or make the innermost loop uh, operate over the columns. Uh, you'll find that the play with different orders of a loop, uh, in a loop nest, play with different orders, you'll get different speeds. And if you're stuck making a choice, if you're really, in some cases, in a piece of code, you'll be stuck with either, okay, I have a nice smooth sequence of reads, but I have to do random writes, or I do random reads, but nice smooth writes. You probably want to favor the random reads over the random writes. And then if you're a real hot shot, you do so-called blocked algorithms, which complicate your code, but get you some speed, where 
particularly on, ma on matrices, a blocked algorithm, instead of operating on rows or columns, it operate on submatrices. And so you decompose your work into little cache sized blocks of the matrix and operate on the blocks. And that's a whole, oops. It's a whole three hour discussion in itself. So just look up cache oblivious algorithm if you want to know more. All right, I got two more exercises. I, well, it's only, we only have 27 minutes left. What if I, I'll go through the rest of the stuff and then we'll come back to those exercises. Oops. All right, just yeah, a few words on vectorization. Most of the uh, modern processors have so-called single instruction multiple data units, where a single instruction can operate on, say, four pieces of data, or eight, or I guess Intel, we're up to 16 out of crack. I think some of the GPUs, what is it, 30? I think some of them go 32 wide now. And yeah, don't confuse the term. The term vectorization means two, com two some very different things. In the old literature, vectorization only meant one thing. It meant this transformation to so-called single instruction, multiple data instructions. And some of the, I guess, where it got started. The, the other meaning was the uh, Fortran 90 style of coding. So here, a single instruction here can add to uh, small, short uh, vectors of elements. So given a loop, I can mark it with, okay, I have to mark it two things here. I have to mark it at SIMD, and that tells the compiler to try to use SIMD instructions, and that the, oh, the important thing is also tells the compiler that I don't care about, th each iteration is independent. There's no, like the, the kth and the jth iterations have no effect on each other for k and j not, are, are different. And then the inbounds, I have to do that to turn off the, uh, the subscript checking. That, that's a requirement right now. But if I do that, then the code behaves, and this is a cartoon on the bottom. Uh, it's not actually real code, but it says it behaves as if the loop was unwound by a factor of four and chunks of four elements were handled at a, at a time. So like, it's as if the code it lo loads a tuple of elements, loads another tuple, does a scalar times tuple, add and store. And each of those operations is on the processor like a single instruction. But treat, treat the bottom of that slide as a cartoon. It's, it's not real code. Now if you're not careful, now the, the, the serial order evaluation of, of the, the original code is I do one iteration, then I do the next. So serial order, I, I finish the first iteration before I work on the, on the next one. The, with the, the SIMD command there, it's gonna do, the order is as shown here. There is no order horizontally, and there's no guarantees what happens. And maybe eventually we'll get to something called wavefront order, uh, where at, at SIMD does this thing. It's, it's called wavefront order, where it's where the ordering basically forces this thing to move from the upper left corner to the lower right. But we're not there yet. So right now, all you can assume is this order. E each iteration is ordered, but all bets are off between iterations. Let's say, okay. For instance, now with the at SIMD, you're promising that the uh, uh, that the answer to the always legal question is you're saying yes, it's legal. Trust me. The compiler may still decide that hey, it's not profitable. I'm I'm not doing this. So yeah, there's this distinction between, and sometimes the compiler will say that, it, it, oh, I can figure out how to vectorize this anyway. So there's a distinction between, there's implicit vectorization where the compiler automatically does it, and explicit vectorization where you have to tell the compiler, yes, it's okay to do it. So in, in an implicit form, yeah, the compiler will prove that, if you notice back here on the original slide, the, uh, this is a very different, or 
This order here of operations is very different than the, the, the serial order because it's missing those uh, diagonal pieces. So in, in, implicit vectorization, the compiler has to prove that the two orders are the same. Or it's just like not the same. The two orders give you the same result as far as you can tell without using a debugger at the assembly code level. So it's going to either prove it's legal or it's going to sort of runtime check. In, in practice, a lot of times it'll check like, uh, oh, if these two things defer to different objects, two different matrices, I can go vectorize it. Otherwise, I'll use like a backup, a backup case loop to deal with the case where they refer to the same matrix. Okay, explicit vectorization. When you mark something with at simd, you're say, the programmer is saying, trust me, it's okay, it's legal. Now we should strike, oh, this slide is out of date. It says experimental feature. I think we've had it in what, two releases now? It, it's there. There was concern <laughs> initially. So there, yeah, when you write at simd, you're saying that the individual loop iterations are independent, go to it. You're saying it, it is a, it's okay. Um, compiler may still say it's not profitable and re re reject it. So here's an example, yeah, just quickly, the compiler sometimes will do through automatic uh, SIMD with a runtime check. Basically, the compiler insert code basically says, yeah, if Y and X are, don't overlap each other, it can, it's safe to, to uh, execute this with SIMD instructions, otherwise it's not. Compiler's pretty good about this. If you only have like about, I think it's like four or five arrays in a, 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 a loop, it'll put in the automatic checks and deal with it. But it will, um, you know, say, it's, the checking is like quadratic in the number of arrays, so there's a, 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 it can only go up to about four or five to do it. There's also, it punts on tricky subscript patterns right now. Maybe it'll get better in the future. Let's see, reductions, what else? What time are we? Okay, reduction variable is one that is, um, you use it, it's, it, typically it's a sum. But something that you're uh, updating with an associative, oper associative and commutative operation and not using its value inside the loop and the, ve the, the, ve the uh, vectorizer in LLVM is pretty good about these as long as you restrict yourself to add, subtract, multiply, divide, or no, not divide. Add, multiply, I think there may be some stuff for subtract these days. And bitwise and and or. But lo lo logically, an example like this will behave, oh, yeah, I guess, all right. It'll behave as though it ate four, four iterations at the same time. Um, oh, the key point is here, when it does, when, when, uh, the, the vectorization reduction, it changes the order of operations. It's no longer strict left to right summation. It's like accumulating four subsums. And then it's going to, uh, sum those sum sums finally. So it's, it's commuting and reassociating uh, the arithmetic. So here's, yeah, the, the serial order of evaluation for that sum. Oops, not so fast. And the, vec the vectorized form is gonna keep a couple copy, uh, copies around and then when it's done, to a, a tree some of those. So the implication of this, because you have to reorder the reduction, for integers, reordering the operations, you get the same result no matter what. For floating point, you don't because of small round off differences. So the implicit vectorization will work fine for integer reductions, but it's not going to work um, f uh, for ordinary floating point reductions unless you mark them with fast math. You mark them with fast math, then things are good. Otherwise, if you use at simd on a loop, then that, you're saying, please vectorize, and yes, I give you permission to reassociate um, and recommute uh, addition and multiplication reductions. And not yet implemented are the uh, 
oh, floating point min and max, as far as I know, still don't work for, for, for reduction. I mean, you get the right answer, just it, it'll refuse to uh, vectorize the loop. OK, one thing, yeah, I'll throw some people is that the, uh, <laughs> geez, I have hardware that has a vector size of 8, and I run this loop through, and I put apps in D, and it speeds up by a factor of 12, which is pretty impressive on hardware that's only 8 wide. But that's the thing, is that at SIMD gives uh, permission to re reorder the loop iterations. It's saying, well, I don't, I don't, actually it says I don't care about the order of the loop iterations. So what it's also giving permission to do is to uh, put more instructions in flight. So for example, if I, this is just an example for a unit with a four wide SIMD unit. If I use at SIMD on the loop for a reduction, it's getting permission not only to do four summations in parallel, actually it's getting permission to do as many as it wants in parallel, so it can do eight at a time. So the, the compiler will actually unroll the loop not by four, do, do four uh, iterations at once, it actually do eight. And it's doing that, even though the instructions when I work on four things at a time, it can do essentially eight at a time because it'll just pack in one instruction does four, and another instruction does four other things, and they'll be overlapped in time. So the at SIMD, sometimes it can perversely speed things up, even though it gave, <laughs> uh, it's not just from the SIMD instructions, it's from the, for me, the, the lax permissions it gives on reordering stuff. So for vectorization, yeah, you need no cross iteration dependencies. No iteration of a loop can depend upon another loop iteration, because it simply, it won't vectorize it implicitly, the compiler won't do it implicitly, and if you mark with at SIMD, you'll get wrong answers. Uh, the trip count of the loop must be obvious. That's actually not a big deal for Julia because the, the four loops, the trip count can be, that's the number of times through the loop. It can be computed directly. It's more of an issue for C and C++ where the trip count rules are complicated. The, uh, okay, the loop, oh, limitation of the LL, right now we're dependent upon LLVM. Its vectorizer only does straight line code with a few exceptions. For, an at, uh, for a loop to be vectorized, it pretty much has to be just no, no if-elses, no loops inside it. There's a few exceptions. Uh, I think I sh show one a little later. Oh, and the subscripts have to be unit stride for the most part. That means you want the, the loop, the SIMD loop needs to be over the, uh, the right, sorry, the leftmost subscript, the, the column subscript. Okay, and you can't have any uh, cross-iteration dependencies. One iteration's values can't affect another iteration. The exception is reduction variables. And, uh, I don't get it, okay. Let's not get into the, the pile of geek stuff. Okay, the trip count, pretty much the, uh, the requirement, oh, if you're messing with stuff other than the, the, the basic Julia uh, loop stuff, it, the requirement is that the length of the range has to return an in integer. Okay, the loop body, yeah, so it should be straight line code. There's a few exceptions here. Oh, all the method calls have to be inlined. It won't vectorize if you uh, or generate SIMD instructions if there's any method calls that aren't inline. So your code has to be, have, have to be type stable. The compiler has to be able to figure out from the calling arguments to the function, the types of everything inside that uh, loop if it's going to do the SIMD instructions. Uh, you have to turn off, oh, inbounds. You have to turn off the bounds checking inside the loop. And, okay, I said no, no branches. There's a few, eh, the, 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 the and, and, or, or question mark colon. If they're short enough expressions, the compiler is smart enough to turn it into straight line code, but it, um, you have to be, you have to under, there's some, trick, some trickiness there. In particular, to turn it into straight line code, it has to be absolutely sure that like an A question mark B colon C, and the compiler has to be absolutely sure that B and C, if I evaluate both of them, regardless of what A is, neither will fault. If there's any risk that either will fault, it's, it can't do that because presumably the program is using A to pick the one that doesn't fault. 
So just yeah, for an example where it actually does work. The, uh, oops. Hang on, I just want to show. Yeah, this one is. It has a very short question mark colon construct. It had two nested question marks for checking some bound stuff. And the uh, it's short enough code that the compiler can turn it into straight line. Basically, remove the branches, turn it into straight line code. And it knows there's no chances of things. It can do that when it, it knows that the branches won't fault, even if it was the branch that wasn't supposed to be taken. Okay, unit stride. Oops. I'm going to say, here's an example. It doesn't quite, or, it, it violates a unit stride rule. The, uh, I have two times i there, so it's skipping by twos. And so actually the compiler will attempt to vectorize it and use the SIMD instructions, but it does it, does it badly because the instructions really aren't there to deal with stuff that's skipping by twos. So it actually runs fast. It, it, it heroically tries and then at least backfires the last time I tried it. Maybe some of, the newer, some of the newer Intel hardware has the, the so-called gather instructions that can deal with that. Maybe it'll get better. Yeah, I should try. So I, I, ran, I haven't run, rerun this code on the latest hardware. This, should try it on Skylake. OK, 2D arrays. Yeah, the, uh, they can, you can do SIMD on 2D arrays. Just make sure that your inner loop is the one marching over columns, which is what you want anyway, for, even for serial code executing on arrays because of the, the caching effects. So, yeah, programmer responsibilities. The, the, uh, yeah, vectorization, the responsibilities are split between the compiler and the uh, programmer. So for all the vectorization, you need to know cr no cross iteration dependencies. That means you can figure each iteration, you have to be able to execute and get the right answer without depending upon any other iteration running. You need a, a, a straight line loop body. The vectorizer doesn't deal with branches very well. And oh, you need to slap in the inbounds because the inbound, without that, the bounce checking is putting in a branch you can't deal with. And all the calls have to be inlined. And yeah, unit side subscript so far. So the implicit vectorizer actually does it does pretty well sometimes. You just if you slap in like the inbounds, uh, the implicit vectorizer sometimes will just do the rest, as long as you're just touching a few arrays. And there's no floating point. Uh, if you're run, running in trouble with floating point reductions, maybe the fast math is enough. And then there's explicit vectorization where you're hitting the compiler on the head and say, "Yes, please vectorize," um, or at least saying, "There's no problem. Trust me." Uh, you throw out SIMD on the loop. Make sure there's no cross-iteration dependencies because you said, trust me, if there are cross-iteration dependencies, you'll get strange answers. And you do your reductions in local scalar variables and the compiler just recognizes the pattern. So sometimes you have to restructure your, your code for uh, SIMD. Like here's a code on the left, does a uh, sums the rows of a matrix or sorry, it does running sums on each row of a matrix. And then it turns out though for SIMD, uh, and then the, the, the code on the right does uh, running sums also, but it's on columns. And the, uh, what is it, the, the row one can't be, it can't be vectorized as written because the, uh, it's the running sum is the problem. The, uh, what is it? The, the, oh, because the one on the, the one on the left, the running sum is is over things that are right, far apart, if I remember right. Uh, saying that well, and the one on the sorry, the one on the right. I'm trying to remember why that doesn't inbounds. Why doesn't that vectorize? Sorry, I can't remember why. What annoyed it? I, I, I. Not sure about the one on the right now. Why does it vectorize? 
Okay, if I restructure, uh, the, the point I want to get through here is uh, restru restructuring the stuff. Um, the one on the, the, the left was the, 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 uh, is the original code. And then if I, I, I want to restructure it, actually per, uh, perversely, uh, let's see, what's the deal here? Oh, the loop order. I am shuffling, I, I am putting the, the, the innermost loop, I need to be the, the I loop there. So I'm, oh, it catches, I want the I, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to accumulate these sums, but I want to accumulate the sums uh, using the SIMD instructions. I don't want to, I don't want to accumulate each, each, each one in a scalar. I want to accumulate, like if I have eight wide SIMD hardware, I want to accumulate eight sums at the same time. So basically I want to uh, play with the loop, loop order so that I'm accumulating eight, eight at the same time. So what I do is in the inner loop here, I accumulate the, uh, the, the sums like that. Uh, so, oh, I'm doing running sums, not reductions. That, that's what I was missing in my head. I'm using, uh, 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 the, the running sums, I'm, I'm not, with the reduction, I, I execute, I, I sum into a variable, and then I use the variable outside the loop. I don't use it inside. With the, uh, these uh, cumulative sums, I'm using the variable inside the loop. So what I do is I, I restructure things. So I turn this variable s that was a scalar. I turn it into a, I, I turn it into an array, and now my inner loop there, that inner i, I loop, I can do uh, SIMD instructions, element basically element wise sums into s sub i, element wise sums into a sub uh, i comma j, and everything is element wise on the column index, and things are happy because then it can be replaced with the SIMD instructions. So here, just to show some differences in the times, the uh, R sum was the original version, D sum was uh, doing the downward sums, and then the, uh, the SIMDI R sum is the one that's been, the, the, it's the R sum, but the loops have been interchanged uh, and set up so to favor the, the SIMD, and it behaves much faster. And there's also an, uh, another point here is that there's two spikes in the blue line. You see, there's two, sp two spikes where it's much slower. Lower is better on this graph. There's two spikes on the blue line where R sum behaves much worse. Those are where I set the array dimensions to exactly a power of two. And it turns out those are, ba those are bad because of the way the cache systems work. You re powers of two are not your friend for array dimensions. It's like, yes, you can do the subscripts calculations using shift instructions instead of multiply, but those operations are practically free on a modern processor. Uh, it's the interference with the way the cache systems work that's the big hit. Set associativity, not enough set associativity. Yeah, not enough. So, or you just you run out of, yeah, associativity. Yes, yeah, right. If you had infinite associativity, it wouldn't be a big issue. <laughs> So just a general recommendation, avoid powers of two for your, uh, at least the, the leading dimension of the array. So yeah, just to review here, the, uh, the memory hierarchy, the, the memory bandwidth can be a limiting resource. The, uh, the cache lines are the quanta of information moved from main memory to the machine. So then cache line and Julia are gonna be uh, consecutive elements in a row, in a, sorry, column of a matrix. So yeah, Julie raised a column major just like Fortran, not like C, not like C++, not like Algol. Uh, hardware can keep multiple operations in flight. I didn't go, uh, go into great detail on that, but the, the, the trick is that, well, there was that one example where I had the, the speed up that was faster than the SIMD with the speed up by 12 on eight wide SIMD. It's, uh, the hardware can do multiple things in flight. So you want to pay attention to the, the, the uh, there, there's the latency, instructions have two quantity, qualities. There's this latency, how long does it take to execute, and how, uh, the throughput, how many can the machine execute per cycle? And often, latencies might be three or four, but every cycle the machine can issue one. So having results depend upon other results is generally bad. You only want to have that if you have to have that dependence. Okay, SIMD can compute multiple results at, for the cost of one result. Okay, transforms. Just quickly, constant propagation, let the compiler do it. 
uh, algebraic simplification, uh, the compiler can do it for integers. Sometimes you got to use fast math for floating point. For inlining, I usually trust the compiler. There's a few examples where you have to force, force it with at inline or at no inline. Eliminating bounds checks, yeah, I use at inbounds. And if you want a quick experiment, you can run, if you think your code is safe and doesn't have out of bounds accesses, use uh, check bounds equals yes and check bounds equal no, see if it makes any difference. Uh, hoisting loop invariants, uh, the compiler can do local scalar calculations, but field and subscript references that are invariant, you need to ho hoist yourself. Unrolling loops, let the compiler do it. You're just, you're just making life difficult for the compiler writer if you do it by hand. Uh, vectorization, yeah, let the compiler, yeah, the compiler does it, but sometimes you have to use inbounds on the subscripts and use uh, at SIMD sometimes to give an assist to the compiler and say, I promise. It, the order doesn't matter for the loop iterations. Okay, types, uh, concrete types run much faster. Concrete types, one that the compiler knows. Avoid, it avoids the boxing and generic dispatch overhead. Let's say, particularly pay attention to type inference and compute kernels. At the high level code, it's just the, the orchestrating stuff. Gotta get your code written. Don't worry about the performance if it's only 1% of the code execution time. Even if it's 5%, don't worry about it. Uh, it's, it's those low level leaves where most of the time is spent. Use the profiler to find out where the code time is spent. Uh, yeah, avoid in the code where the time is spent, avoid referencing global variables. Pull them into like locals and then call an auxiliary routine if you can. Uh, okay. Yeah, parametric types work better than abstract types for generality often. Like an example of the, uh, the coordinate, or what was it, the, uh, the x, y, and the r. Make it a, a parameterize the type instead of let, where x, y, and i are of some known type t. Type t that's a parameter to the type instead of saying x, y, and r are, say, real, which is an abstract type. OK, finally, just yeah, suggested program structure. The high level code, don't worry about performance. Get, get your job done. <laughs> that's where you're experimenting, I mean, experimenting and shuffling stuff around. Uh, that's the fun with Julia, is interactively experimenting with the stuff. Uh, then, when it calls down in the call chains, then you start the worry. And where the call chains, where the time is spent, after you've profiled the code and know where it's spent, there, there's where you start the worry. And like typically, this, what you want to do is you call routine, it does the setup, which by, what I mean is does loads of the loads of global variables, that calls the kernel routines, and then when they return, maybe stores results in the global variables. And you set up the kernels so that they have the type inference can infer concrete types for those. There's no global variables. And uh, slap on at SIMD if you want loops if you have loops that are suitable for SIMD execution and you help the compiler down there. Yeah, it's the, the code at the bottom is where you worry about all the geeky performance related stuff. And the other solution is from the high level code, well, if you call like the, the numerical uh, dense linear algebra stuff, uh, just call the blahs and be done with it. I mean, Julia has a lot of interfaces for the, the basic linear algebra subroutines. They're written efficiently. Just run with it. Okay, that's all. Um, the other two problems, I guess people want to hang around or back there if people have questions, you know, I'll be around. And I'll put the slides out on the website where the problems were. I think that's the easiest place to find them for now.